Hi, good morning, good morning. Okay, let's see if I have a feedback now. Feedback? No. All right, good. Okay. I think we're ready. Technology. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions on what you read in chapter one? Any questions? Good morning. No questions? All right, so you should have read chapter one in the yellow book. I know it shows blue. I've got to change it. <laughs> I know you read chapter one in the yellow book. Did you take the test on page 132 in the white book? And did you grade that test? Did you grade the test? Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm going to go down my list and I'm going to call your name. And when I call your name, if you can tell me how many you got wrong on chapter one, okay? On the test on page 132. And like I said, grades don't really matter to me. I don't care about grades, but if you're reporting low scores, that lets me know that you're struggling with something. So then I can jump in and help you a little bit more effectively, okay? Stephanie? Very good. Micaiah? Okay. Go ahead and take a few minutes. Valentina? I think I just too wrong. Too wrong. Nerlene? Okay, none wrong. Did you get any wrong? Okay. All right. Alexa? Okay. All right, and Brianna is not here. Okay, um, on the front of your yellow book is a number. Should start with Y, Y1, Y2. When I call your name, if you can tell me what that number is, that just helps me keep track of who has what book. So Stephanie, Micaiah, Valentina, Nerlene, on the front of your yellow book, yellow book, <coughs> this number, what is yours? No, no, so this number, Y1. Alexa, thank you. Oh, very good, good job. All right, so if you look at your syllabus tonight over, or actually over the weekend, you're gonna have two chapters to read. And this is how the, the class runs. So on Mondays, you have one chapter, on Wednesdays, you have two chapters because you have the whole weekend to get it done, okay? So when you go home sometime between now and Monday, you're gonna read chapters two and three and take the tests in the white book on page 133 and 134, just like you did for chapter one, but it's two chapters, okay, good? Now these chapters are a little bit longer, a little bit more complex. So you may have to take a little bit, budget a little bit more time, but the best way to study is not to study all at once. Don't try to sit down for two hours and go through all of it because you're not going to retain it. Your brain just kind of gets saturated. So it's best to study in small increments, 10 or 15 minutes. Go do something mindless. Wash the dishes, walk the dog, 
play with the kids, things that something that your brain doesn't have to be overly engaged in, that allows your brain time to digest and categorize what you just read. And it kind of puts it into um, long-term memory. And then if you read a little bit more after that, you're, you're coming at it fresh. You'll retain more information if you study in small bursts. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Okay, so let's review really quickly. Um, how do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan, very good, very good. So good morning, Mame, Black Rose, Zizom. Good morning. No questions up there for me right now. Um, yeah, the care plan tells us what we're gonna do with each patient. So that tells us that not all skills are gonna be done the same way on every patient. Unfortunately, people are not assembly line products, right? People are all a little bit different. You can have 12 people with diabetes in the same unit, but they're all gonna require slightly different care because they're different people. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have to understand just how important that care plan is in adapting the skill to that patient. So for us, we are going to follow the care plan. Good? All right. Did anyone catch my live uh, practice test game show yesterday? Did anybody catch that? Yeah, the, the questions there were really good at um, helping you um, identify you know how to respond to emergencies and it's a really good one you probably want to go back and watch it it's on my youtube channel you can watch the replay it's a good one you're probably going to watch it it's going to go right along with what you're going to read in chapter two and three so the questions that i went over yesterday in the game show is very relevant to what you're going to be reading for um this this week's homework so you might want to go back and watch that Remember that every skill starts the same way. Starts with the opening. What does every opening start with? A knock, yeah. So our opening is, hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm here to whatever, you know, whatever the skill is, is that okay? I'm gonna close the curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies and get started. At the end of every skill, we're going to end it the same way. And there's actually, the, the book says there's six Cs. There's actually seven. I was looking at this yesterday because I was doing some work on the uh, website. It can really be kind of boiled down to seven, right? Seven Cs, clean and safe, comfortable, call light, curtain. But we also want to make sure the patient is covered. Right, we don't want to just this. That should look odd to you, right? That doesn't look comfortable, safe. It's a little exposed, right? So covered, and that's actually a checkpoint on the state exam is, is the patient covered at the end of the skill. Now covered could mean dressed, you know, dressed is covered. Um, if they're sitting in a chair at the bedside, they don't need to be covered because they're out of bed. But if they're in bed, covered, somehow not exposed is gonna be an important checkpoint. Then we're going to clean our hands, wash our hands, chart if necessary. And then what do we have to do after we chart? Anybody remember? Yeah, clean our hands again. So there's seven basic C's to the closing. Clean and safe, or I'm sorry, yeah. Um, clean and safe, comfortable, call light, curtain, covered, clean hands, and chart. Clean your hands again. Good, questions? Any questions on all that? Okay. So that's what we learned on Monday. We also learned a little bit about the testing process, how the test runs, how it works. 
so that you can um, have a, basically to help reduce your anxiety. So you can have kind of an idea of what you're walking into. Um, today, we're actually gonna start learning some skills. But to learn the skills, we need to know to follow the care plan. We need to know how to do the opening because that starts our skills. And we have to know how to do the closing because that ends our skills. So right now, out of those 11 principles on the back wall, we already know three. Okay. And it didn't take a whole lot to learn them. It wasn't a lot of memorization. Learning is different than memorizing. Okay. So my goal is to help you learn these principles, not just memorize a bunch of words. So we've learned the skill rules, follow the care plan, report our observations. We learned the opening, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to whatever. Is that okay? Let me go wash my hands or close curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies. We know the closing. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you? Your environment is clean. Bed is in the low position. You're safe. Um, you're covered. Here's your call light. Um, are you comfortable before I go? I'm going to open the curtain, wash my hands, chart if necessary, wash my hands again. So the opening and the closing always done the same way. Today, we're going to learn a few more principles as well. And the first one we're going to start out with is glove rules. Now, gloves, uh, and this is the first principle I teach because a lot of people come into the class with misconceptions regarding gloves. This is this and side rails are probably the two biggest misconceptions I have to get you over, okay? So in order to understand glove rules, we're going to do an activity together to help you kind of see how gloves um, are used and how they should be used. So we're gonna get to that in a second, um, but we have four specific rules that we're going to follow. Now, with gloves, Gloves are part of every single skill we do, not necessarily because we have to wear them, but because we have to evaluate if we need to wear them, okay? So gloves are always a part of every single skill because we have to evaluate. So let me explain to you <coughs> uh, this, how this activity is going to work. Everything we're going to talk about is on page 26 of your white book, so you don't need to take any notes. And at the top of the page here, you see this little video clapboard thing, right? Looks like a, something you'd use in the movies. If you see one of those, that means that I have a video, an animated video on this topic on my website. So if you go to foryourcna.com, look under animated lessons, you'll actually see puzzle it out glove rules. It tells you the name of the video right there. And you can watch that on your own if you find yourself struggling with this concept. Sometimes hearing the same information a different way can help make it click if it didn't click the first way. So I have a ton of resources that you can use if for some reason you're struggling with something on your own. Okay, good. All right, so the question is in healthcare, why do we wear gloves? And most people answer this because of something I told you on Monday. I told you that we take all the sickest people in the community and put them all in one place, right? So the, there's germs everywhere. There are all kinds of pathogens in this setting. So most healthcare workers think about that and they think about gloves and they think to themselves, well, those gloves are there to protect me from all of these pathogens, right? And that seems reasonable because we don't want to catch what they've got. Seems reasonable. But that is not the only reason that we wear gloves. So let me explain this. In order to illustrate, we are going to build a sandwich. And we're going to build this sandwich together. Now, if you've ever gone to a place where they build a sandwich in front of you, what do they always put on before they take your order? 
gloves, right? Now, you feel pretty good about them wearing gloves because you don't want their bare hands touching your food. That's pretty high on our gross meter, isn't it? We don't want bare hands touching our food. So we're happy that they wear gloves. But let's see if that's a really good idea because we might have some false misconceptions here, okay? So first, we need some bread. So what kind of bread would you like? White, wheat, Italian, multigrain, white bread, okay. So we're gonna go over there to the bread rack or, or the, the warmer. We're gonna open the warmer, reach in, get a loaf of bread out, close the warmer and put it on our little work surface here. Now, once we do that, we're going to take that knife that's laying there, pick it up and slice that bread in half and fold it over. And you really have to kind of put some pressure on it to get it to open up so that we can take the next step, right? So we're gonna cut that bread in half. Then we have to figure out what condiments do we want? Do we want mayonnaise? Okay, so I'm going to reach in, and there's always that spreader sticking out of the mayonnaise. I'm gonna reach in, grab the spreader, get some mayonnaise, and we're gonna put it on the bread and put the spreader back in. How about some mustard? Do you want mustard? So I'm going to pick up the sauce bottle and we'll tap it on the counter and we're gonna squeeze the sauce bottle on there as well. So now we've got bread and mayonnaise and mustard. Um, uh, we will skip the secondary sauce today. So um, how about some bacon? Because everything is better with bacon. So we're gonna open the little refrigerator under the counter, get our package of bacon out. We're gonna open the package, take a couple slices of bacon out, close the package and put it back in the, the cooler. And we'll put the bacon on the, um, the counter until we're ready for it. Now we want some meat. What kind of meat would you like? Yeah. Ham. So I'm gonna open the, um, the cooler, look for ham and uh, pull it out put it on the sandwich, close the cooler, and now we need some cheese. Do you want white American, Swiss, provolone? Provolone. Provolone. So we're gonna go to that little cheese drawer and open it up to see, and there's no provolone. Oh no. So now we have to go to our walk-in cooler and open that, go inside, open the um, containers up, find the provolone, and it needs to be sliced. So we're gonna take it over there to the slicer and slice a couple of pieces of provolone. All the um, extra we're gonna put back in that cheese drawer, right? So now we have our bread with mayonnaise and mustard. We've got bacon and ham and provolone. So do we want that toasted? Sure, that sounds good. So we're going to have to wait a minute because somebody's at the toaster. So as we're waiting, we're just gonna kind of stand there and watch where that hand is. It's finally our turn. So we're going to open the toaster, put the sandwich in, touch the dial to turn the timer on, wait. When it dings, we're going to open the toaster oven again, use the paddle, to get our sandwich out and then we'll put it back on the counter. Now we're ready for toppings. Do you want some lettuce on there? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna reach our hand into that big bin of lettuce and get some out and put it on our sandwich. What about tomato, Nerlene? Do you want some tomato? So we'll get a couple pieces of tomato, right? Get a couple pieces of tomato and put that on our sandwich. What about other toppings? Do you want pickles or olives? Pickles? So we'll get into the, the garlic pickles. Okay, we're gonna get into those, squeeze them out. So all, you know, where it's not all soggy, put those on. Anything else? Peppers. So we'll grab a couple of peppers and put those on as well. So lots of toppings. And now we're gonna close that sandwich up. We're gonna pick up our knife and cut it in half. Remember that was the knife we used to cut the bread earlier. We're gonna cut it in half, and then we're going to wrap up each half and put it in a bag. Now you have to pay. So the person's gonna go over to um, the scale and you know, print off the, the label, put it on the package, send you off to um, you know, the checkout area where you can pay. 
right? Are you ready to eat that sandwich? What was wrong with that? But you guys felt good about me wearing gloves while I was building your sandwich. You, you said you didn't want me to touch your sandwich with bare hands. So what was the problem here? Okay. All right. Did those gloves do what you really thought they were going to do? No. Now, I want to preface this by saying there's nothing wrong with that sandwich. There's nothing wrong with it. You can eat it. It's delicious. I'm probably going to go have a sub for lunch now, right? It, it's There's nothing wrong with it. What changed was your perception, okay? This is important in healthcare because we wear gloves, just like food service wears gloves. And just like in food service, we don't pay attention to what we're touching with those gloves. So in healthcare, we are very guilty of doing this. But let's take a look at all the things that these gloves touched in addition to the sandwich. It touched the bread cart. Those gloves touched the knife. The gloves touched the mayonnaise spreader, the sauce bottles, the outside of the bacon package, the cheese drawer. Oops. The door handle to the cooler, the containers inside the cooler, the slicing machine, the table, the toaster oven, the toaster oven controls, the paddle, the lettuce, tomato, and other toppings. And that's probably the worst because all of those th things are open. So they're gonna be touched by a lot of different gloves. The wrapper and of course the, um, uh, you know, the printout, the sticker that goes on the package. So were those gloves really effective? Depends on your point of view. If those gloves were worn to protect the, the sandwich maker, yeah, they were very effective. The sandwich maker didn't touch a thing, right? So if they were worn to protect the sandwich maker from the sandwich, they were effective. But was that really why they wore gloves? What was the reason they were supposed to wear gloves? <clears throat> Okay, to protect you from the food. Now, this is the important part of this, right? In a clinical setting, we are the sandwich maker. We're the ones wearing gloves, and we think that we're wearing those gloves to protect us. But in reality, the patient is the one that really needs to be protected here because the patient is already fighting something off. They have an illness or an injury, and their immune system is currently occupied. Now they're in a place with a lot of pathogens and they know that when you touch all of those things and then you touch them, those pathogens can be transmitted to them, just like the sandwich. So when we're working in healthcare, we have to remember that those gloves, we might think they're for us, but they're not. Those gloves are actually to help prevent contaminating the patient with the pathogens that are in the, the environment. And in healthcare, we are way, way too um, focused on ourselves and not the patient. So you saw that whole list of all the things those gloves touched. And in healthcare, it's even way worse than that because we walk into a room, we put our gloves on and we touch everything. We touch the table and the curtain and the sink and, and the faucet and everything. And then we touch the patient with those gloves. Now, are those gloves really doing what they were supposed to do? So we have to come at gloves with the right mindset. We're going to wear them when it's important to wear them. Yes. And we're going to learn how to uh, take them off properly so we're not cross-contaminating. And we're going to learn how to protect our patient and ourselves while we're wearing gloves. But the biggest thing to remember is we have to focus on who those gloves are really there to protect. Because at the end of the day, you're washing your hands before you do every single skill. 
and you're washing your hands after you do every single skill. So those gloves really are not there to protect you. They're there to protect the patient. The hand washing is there to protect you. Okay, does that make sense? Now, some of you are still a little grossed out by this and you're like, I still don't wanna touch anything with the patient. I wanna wear gloves all the time. So let me talk to you about that. Gloves are not the magic suit of armor that you think they are. They're not. I'm gonna prove it to you. Have you ever had a birthday balloon? You know, the, the latex balloons you go and fill up with helium, bops up against the ceiling for a couple of days, right? What happens to those balloons after a couple of days? They deflate. So how does that happen, right? It's, the balloons are solid. I mean, how, how in the world do they deflate? Well, latex, and that's what most of our gloves are made out of, guys. Latex is a man-made material. And all man-made materials have holes. Now, they're microscopic, teeny tiny holes, but there are holes. Just like your clothing, right? Your clothing is very solid. You can't see through my clothing, but if I held it up to the light, there's little teeny tiny pinprick holes in it that you can see when you hold it up to the light. Well, latex is just like that, but the holes are way smaller. When you inflate that balloon with helium and the material stretches, what happens to those holes? Yeah, they get bigger, right? So over time, those helium molecules are able to wiggle out through those holes, and that's how the balloon deflates, and then eventually it ends up this little tiny sad puff of a balloon. Well, that tells us right away that number one, our gloves have holes. And if helium can get through the, those holes, then viruses, which are way smaller than helium molecules, can definitely get through the holes. And they have done a million um, experiments on this. They've had people wash their hands really, 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 really well. And then they put gloves on them, had them do something with patients, they took the gloves off and they cultured the hands to see, did anything grow? And in a perfect world, nothing would grow, right? Because you washed your hands really, really, really well first, put gloves on, nothing should grow there. And every single time, something grows. Pathogens get through gloves. They do. So gloves are not protecting you the way you think they are, but wait, it gets worse. Have you ever worn gloves? Like to clean your bathroom or something. What do they make your hands do? Sweat, so it holds in heat, blocks out light, and the sweat makes it moist. So we end up with warm, dark, moist. Have we ever heard that? somewhere what grows there okay so we know pathogens get through and now they have the ideal breeding environment on your hands and this is the number one error that people make in healthcare is they put gloves on they work with the patient and then they think to themselves i wore gloves my hands are clean and they don't go wash their hands after Ew. Have you ever gone to a large retail store down the road? <laughs> I won't say the name of it, but have you ever, ever had those older lady uh, cashiers that are scanning stuff wearing gloves, right? Yeah. I just, I, I, I just want to explain this to them <laughs> because they're wearing gloves for a four hour shift and their hands are now nice and sweaty and they didn't want to touch your ketchup bottle because of ick or whatever. But then they go on break, they take those gloves off and they eat their tuna salad sandwich with a side of E. coli because that's what's on their hands. And that E. coli has had a chance to uh, proliferate because of warm, dark, moist. It would actually be much, much better for them if they didn't wear gloves at all and they just washed their hands, right? Now, a lot of people ask me about hand sanitizer at this point. Hand sanitizer is definitely a, a good option. 
Um, what hand sanitizer does, see every uh, pathogen has a membrane around it, like a cell membrane, right? And the hand sanitizer actually breaks apart that membrane. So it's very effective. But the problem is, there's two problems with hand sanitizer, well, three, I'm sorry, there's three problems with hand sanitizers. One of the problems is that even though it breaks apart that cell membrane, so you've got um, hand sanitizer and you're rubbing it around, where do those pathogens go? Damn. Yeah, they don't pop, pop, pop into the atmosphere. Now you've got dead E. coli on your hands and you know a side of fries with dead E. coli just isn't very appetizing, right? So if you're going to eat, you need to wash your hands, not use hand sanitizer, because washing your hands puts all of that stuff down the drain, not on your Big Mac, right? Make sense? So that's problem number one. Those pathogens might be dead, but they don't go anywhere. Problem number two is that we generally don't use enough hand sanitizer to be effective. So this is my little hand sanitizer guy, isn't he cute? Okay, so this is what most of us do when we're using hand sanitizer. We'll take a little bit, we'll rub it on, and we're done, right? That's how hand sanitizer works, except that that didn't work because that hand sanitizer has to remain liquid on your hands for no less than 20 seconds. Oh, where have we heard that before? Hand washing. So in order to be effective, I have to get a lot of hand sanitizer. Do you see how much I have here? I have to get a lot and I've got to rub for at least 20 seconds. Have you guys ever rubbed hand sanitizer for this long? Okay, that's 20 seconds. Anything less than that, it's not effective. Now, why would that be a problem? Well, we have to talk about the immune response here. So, does everybody under, uh, has, everybody, uh, has everybody heard of immunity, right? Means when you get something, chances are, you won't get it again because now you're immune. Or if you've had a vaccine, you're now immune, right? So we, we know that term, but what does it really mean? Well, let's pretend that a bad guy is coming through that door, okay? So a bad guy comes into our room and Nerlene is the first person there. She doesn't want that bad guy to get to the rest of us. So she throws her bottle at it. It didn't do anything. The bottle was not effective, but um, the bad guy is still in here. So we got to do something, right? So Alexa, Alexa um, looks at the bad guy and says, okay, well, I'm going to dump my coffee on them. So Alexa dumps the coffee on them and that's not effective. That doesn't help. So Micaiah, you're up next. You hit him over the head with a book. And that's not effective. So you're up next. How about you stab them with a pen? Hey, we figured out that that works as long as you stab them in a very specific place. Now we know how to kill that intruder, right? So you're gonna tell everybody here, hey, if an intruder ever comes in, don't bother throwing a water bottle or dumping coffee or hitting them over the head, go straight for the <laughs> pen and this is where you hit them, right? So now we've got an instruction guide. So the next time an invader comes in, what are you gonna grab? A pen and you're gonna get rid of them right away because we've got the, the experience behind us, right? And we take notes. Well, that is exactly what your immune system does. That's how the immune system works so that we don't have to spend all of that time hitting them with water bottles or dumping iced coffee or smacking them with a book. We, we can skip all of that time. We go straight to what works. Good. That's what the immune system is. Now, the problem is, the problem is when Nerlene, when, when that invader came in and, and Nerlene hit him with the water bottle, 
if they go outside to all the other bad guys, they can tell them, hey, next time you walk in, avoid the water bottle. They're going to hit you with a water bottle. So we don't want them to know that, right? We don't want them to be able to escape and tell other people what our plans are. Make sense? Okay. That is called resistance. So have you ever heard of MRSA? Methicillin resistant staph aureus. That means that there's lots of staph out there that now knows all of our medications and how they work. So they have learned how to evade because they got the blueprints. They know what our steps are. This is why you're told to take all of your antibiotics. Because if you leave any of them alive, any bacteria alive, after we throw our arsenal at them, they now have our secret cookbook and they know how to evade it. We don't want to do that, right? So when we use hand sanitizer and we don't use enough of it, we leave pathogens alive. And what are they going to tell the other pathogens? How do we evade? Right. You see how that might be a problem? So hand sanitizer works now just like antibiotics worked 30 years ago. But antibiotics don't work as well now. We're going to have the same problem with hand sanitizer if we don't learn to use it properly. Does that make sense? Yeah, pathogens are nothing to play with. You got to kill them dead. Okay. So the first problem is that path or that uh, hand sanitizer um, remains on your hands, even though that's dead, remains on your hands. Second problem is we don't use it right. Third problem is that it doesn't work at all on two major league pathogens. Hand sanitizer does not work on C. diff and it does not work on the norovirus. They're shown to be ineffective on those two things. So these are pathogens that make you feel like crap. C. diff gives you diarrhea for at least eight weeks that you can't get rid of and will deplete your system. It's horrible, spreads like wildfire. Norovirus is something called the daycare disease or the cruise ship disease. It spreads in close quarters and it causes vomiting and diarrhea for three to five days. It'll definitely ruin a cruise, definitely ruin a cruise, but it spreads very, very fast in close quarters, you know, like daycares and cruise ships. Neither one of those is a is uh, affected by hand sanitizer. So in order to keep yourself safe, if your hands are gonna go anywhere near your face, what do you think you should do before your hands get near your face? Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Don't rely on hand sanitizer. And the problem is that our hands get near our face way more often than we realize it, like there and there and there, right? If you want a fun experiment, go to a public place like um, a fast food restaurant, order a Coke and just sit there and watch how many times people touch their face. Okay, we touch it when we're eating, obviously, but we also touch it a million other times as well. And this is where all of our pathogens are able to enter the most easily. Now, there's other places that pathogens can enter, but your face has the most holes on it and is the most accessible. That brings us to the chain of infection. So this is something that you do need to learn, that you need to be familiar with. Okay, we're going to talk about a little bit more as we go through the program, but Every chain of infection starts with a pathogen. No pathogen, no problem, right? No pathogen, no problem. But the problem is that we have pathogens all over. 
Um, so when you have a pathogen out in the open, it's not really a danger. The, first of all, pathogens don't really survive well out in the open. They need a house to live in. Uh, they don't do well homeless. They need a house. So if you have a pathogen and it has a place to live, a host, a reservoir of some sort, um, this is usually a human when we're talking about our stuff. When that pathogen is inside that human, it's not really much of a threat to you, okay? So to demonstrate, these are my little HIV guys. Everybody know what HIV is? Human immunodeficiency virus. It's a virus that causes AIDS. And we've got a pretty good handle on it right now. But you now have HIV, okay? So, pathogen, problem. Pathogen now has a host. But as long as she keeps her HIVs to herself, none of you guys are really affected, okay? Even you, you can sit next to her and her HIV is well-contained. She's not bleeding on anything. So her HIV is happy inside of her because it's in its house. It's content. It's wreaking havoc in her, but it's not really much of an issue, right? Now, the problem is, can you take one of those and just put it on the table? Okay. So the problem is that if one of those pathogens is able to escape its host, so this now, that thing didn't jump out of there by itself, did it? It required somebody to move it or something to relocate it, right? So pathogens don't walk. There's no arms and legs on that guy. They don't fly. There's no wings on that guy. They literally sit in their container until something else happens to allow them to move, good? So we have a pathogen, it's inside a container. As long as it's inside the container, it doesn't really affect anybody else. It's only if that pathogen is able to get out of its container somehow. So this usually happens through blood or body fluids. Because remember, they can't walk, no arms, no, no legs, no wings, can't fly. So they have to hitch a ride usually in some sort of liquid, okay? So body fluids, blood, they have to have a doorway out, right? The top of the container is open, doorway out and a fluid to travel in. Now, that pathogen, she's looking at that going, mm, I don't wanna touch that, right? Because now I know it's getting really close to me. It's no longer safe in that house. It's open, it's searching for a new home. Remember, they don't like to be homeless, right? But in order to get into her, it's no real threat on the table there. It's gotta have a way into her. So if you just reach over and touch that thing, that's not that bad. You can go wash your hands and wash it right off, right? Because it didn't get in you. But if it has a doorway in, if you put it in your mouth or it's able to get in your eyes or you breathe it in or you have a cut, if it's able to get in you, now it's a problem. Make sense? You with me? All right. But you still have to be susceptible to this. So if your body has seen this invader, a million times before, and it knows the water bottle doesn't work, the coffee doesn't work, the book doesn't work. We're going to go straight to the pen, jab it in the right place, and get rid of our pathogen. You are not susceptible because you know how to get rid of it. You know how to defeat it, right? So if we're vaccinated, we are not a susceptible host. It dies right there. If we've had this virus before and learned how to defeat it, you're not a susceptible host. It dies right there. You have to be susceptible for it to do any damage. And if you're susceptible, well, now you have a pathogen inside your body. 
And that pathogen is still not a threat to her because it's inside you. So does this make sense to you guys? Biggest thing to remember is no pathogen, no problem. But if there's a pathogen inside a body, it's not much threat unless the pathogen is able to get out and travel. Then it's gotta be able to get inside you and you have to be susceptible. That's the only way for pathogens to be able to move about the country. They don't fly, they don't walk, they don't leap. They have to have a doorway out and a mode of transportation, usually fluid. So if you're gonna touch anybody else's fluids, you kind of have to assume that they probably have some sort of pathogen in them, right? So the way that we remember this is if I'm going to do a skill that involves me touching somebody else's fluids, I want an extra layer of protection because I'm not entirely sure if I have any of these on my hands. Extra layer of protection. That's all a glove is. It's like a second set of skin. But when you take those gloves off, you have to remember to wash your hands because anything that got through was able to multiply. Does that make sense? Good. All right, so let's go back to here. Here. So we have some rules to follow. If we're going to touch anything ooey gooey that's not ours, like body fluids, her, um, blood, urine, feces, sexual fluids, saliva, if I'm going to touch anything ooey gooey that came out of somebody else's body, I want to wear some gloves just to have an extra layer of protection. But I definitely want to wash my hands first because remember, gloves are two ways, right? If pathogens can get in, that means that pathogens can get out as well. I don't want to give my patient anything that might be on my hands from another patient. So I need to wash my hands first, put my gloves on, do my skill, take my gloves off. And then what do I need to do? Wash my hands again. So if I'm going to touch any body fluids, I'm definitely going to wear some gloves. If I'm going to touch personal skin, now this is best defined as anything covered by a bathing suit. Okay. So breast area on females, genital area on both sexes. If I'm going to be anywhere in those neighborhoods, I'm going to have a set of gloves on. Not necessarily because there might be body fluids, although there might in the genital area, but more because I need a level of separation, right? I don't want to touch a woman's breast area with bare hands. That's just a little too personal, and it's probably going to make her very uncomfortable. Okay. So personal skin requires gloves, non-intact skin. So non-intact skin would be wounds, sores, rashes, incisions, cuts, um, anywhere where the skin is not intact. But it could also mean normal body openings, what we call wet body openings, your eyes, your nose, your mouth your genitals, your rectal area, any body openings or non-intact skin, because remember that lets things in and that lets things out, okay? So if I'm gonna touch body fluids, personal skin or non-intact skin, I definitely need some gloves. But if I decide I need to wear gloves, what's the first thing they should touch, do you think? The patient. If I'm touching the sink, that means I'm putting pathogens on my gloves. If I'm touching the bed, I've got pathogens on my gloves. If I'm touching the bedside drawers, I now have pathogens on my gloves. And if I'm gonna brush your teeth, do you want me to have clean gloves in your mouth or pathogen covered gloves? Clean. So the very first thing our gloves should touch is the patient. And this is what trips up most CNAs because they'll get the first one right, Okay, I need gloves. I'm going to be brushing teeth. That's, that's body fluids. I need some gloves. But then they'll walk in the room, put gloves on very first thing, and then touch everything in the room 
and then try to brush the patient's teeth with those gloves, right? We have to be mindful of cross-contamination. And then once we have put our gloves on and we've done our skill, now we have to be aware of what we're touching in the environment with those patients' body fluids on them. So we wanna look at the potential for cross-contamination. And then at the end of the skill, we have to know how to remove our gloves correctly. So, is anybody allergic to latex? Okay. These are small. You may have to stretch them a little bit to get them on. Go ahead and put your gloves on. You're welcome. Okay. So we have our gloves on and we did our skill, whatever the skill was. So now our gloves are soiled and we wanna be careful to take them off before we start touching a ton of stuff in the patient environment because we don't wanna cross contaminate. So we have to take these off and we gotta take them off right because if we do it wrong, we're going to contaminate our own skin. So dirty glove can touch dirty glove all day long. This is fine. Dirty glove cannot touch skin. So in order to take this glove off, I cannot go underneath. I need to pinch up here. When I pinch up, I'm gonna pull this one off inside out and ball it up in this hand. That way it's not waving around, splashing fluids everywhere. It's controlled. Now skin can touch skin, this is fine but I can't touch the gloves, so I can't do this. You can't do this. I can't touch the glove with skin. So in order to do this, I need to go underneath and pull that off inside out. So one inside out glove is inside the other inside out glove. So go ahead and pinch up the first one and take it off. Ball it up in your hand. Go underneath the second glove and take it off. I know they're a little, little small. Okay, now you got a pair of gloves to go home and clean your toilet with. All right. Now there is another problem with gloves. And that problem is not something that most people talk about. I am not an environmentalist. I don't recycle. I don't do the things that I should do to protect the environment. I like styrofoam cups because I keep my drinks colder. I drive a gas guzzler because I like power, right? I'm not an environmentalist, but this actually did impact me. When you take that, that pair of gloves off, where do you normally put it? In the trash, right? Well, latex gloves, the ones that you have, they are biodegradable, but it takes years and years and years to biodegrade. But that's actually not what we use in most healthcare settings anymore. We don't use latex much. We use the colored gloves. These are nitrile or vinyl gloves. Now, because latex, a lot of people have latex allergies. So we've kind of moved away from latex. They are biodegradable, but it takes a long time. The vinyl and nitrile gloves are not biodegradable at all. That means that every pair of gloves that you take off and put in the trash will be on this planet 100,000 years from now. Now, when I figured that out, huh, that's a lot of gloves. Now we used to burn them all. That's how we got rid of them. Back in the eighties, man, we burned everything patient used. And my very first office was next to the incinerator at the hospital that I worked at. It was awesome because I'm cold all the time. So my office was nice and warm, it was great. 
But the problem is that we realized by burning all these plastic items, it put things up into our atmosphere that ate our ozone layer. That's not good. So we had to stop doing that. So then somewhere along the line, somebody said, you know, we've got this big ocean out there that nobody's using. Let's put all of this stuff in big metal drums, poke holes in the top, take them out to the Pacific Ocean, drop them in. They'll fill with water, sink to the bottom. Nobody will know they're there. It's a great option. Great. So we did. For years and years and years and years, we took all of our medical waste out to the ocean, dropped it in, and it sunk to the bottom. Fantastic. Except now the fish that we're pulling out of the Northern Pacific has high levels of latex, and we can't eat them. We poisoned our own food supply. Probably not a good idea. So we stopped doing that. So now all we're doing is stockpiling this medical waste. Well, that doesn't sound like too bad of an idea. I mean, there's lots of land available. We use, I'm just talking healthcare. I'm not talking about dental, housekeeping, industrial, food service. I'm not, not talking about them. Just healthcare, just America, no other countries, just America, just healthcare. We use enough gloves every day to fill a football stadium 35 feet deep in gloves. Just gloves? Just gloves. Doesn't take long to figure out that that's not sustainable. It's not. It will be a problem. It will. It's not going to be my problem. I'm out of here in like 30 years. But it's going to be my granddaughter's problem. They're going to have to deal with this somehow. We can't burn it. We can't drown it. So we got to get a little smarter about when we use them. We got to figure out when they're necessary. So if you're going to wear gloves all the time for absolutely everything, you're contributing to a problem that somebody is going to have to solve later needlessly. Because remember, if you wash your hands before, you're, you've got clean hands for the patient. If you wash your hands after, all the pathogens that you came into contact with are down the drain. Gloves are not essential for routine patient contact, unless you're coming into contact with body fluids, skin openings, or personal skin. Remember that chain of infection we talked about? Make sense? Make sense? So that's what we're trying to do. If, if you are going to be working anywhere around a pathogen, an area a pathogen can get out, we want an extra layer. If we're going to be working around any fluids, we want an extra layer. If you have any doorways in, you want an extra layer. Other than that, we don't need gloves. Remember, no pathogen, no problem. As long as pathogen's safe in its house, no problem. Okay. Good. Make sense? Did I get you to think about gloves just a little bit differently? Okay. All right. That's one of the hardest things for you to learn is gloves. If for the test, you, you decide for the test to go in and wear gloves for everything, they're going to actually tell you you don't need gloves for that they will stop you. And if you're used to wearing gloves for everything, that'll really mess you up for the test. So you do need to know when it's appropriate to wear gloves and when it's not. Now, how do I put this? You're already stressed out for the test, guys. You're already stressed out. You don't wanna add any additional curveballs, any additional layers of stress. It would be way easier for me, way easier to teach you if I could just tell you, yeah, we're gloves for everything, it's fine. I mean, that, that would be, that, we just took an hour long lecture down to one sentence, wear gloves for everything, right? It would be way easier for me to do that. 
So why do I spend all of this time telling you all of this stuff? Because it matters. It, ma it matters in the test. It matters in the workplace. And it matters for your own safety as well. It matters. But one of the questions I get asked a lot is, well, why don't you put on, you know, on the, the book, you know, where you have all the stuff for um, the test, why don't you just put whether gloves are required there? You know, you're telling me whether we're going to do this on a patient or a mannequin. You're telling me how long it's going to take. You're telling me whether they're in a bed or a chair. Just put whether I need gloves. And I can't do that because gloves aren't based on the skill. They're based on the patient you're doing the skill on. Because if I'm doing range of motion on this lady right here, I'm not touching any body fluid. She has no open sores. I'm not near any personal skin. I don't need gloves to do exercises on her arm. Don't need them. But what if she has an incision on that arm? Now I need gloves. So it's not based on the skill. It's based on the patient. So you have to evaluate this for every single skill we do. Wearing gloves isn't a part of every skill. Evaluating whether you need them, that's a part of every skill. Good? Make sense? Everybody good with that? I actually have a question. Yes. Now, I know you're supposed to wash your hands before you touch the patient and stuff. Uh, what if, let's say, do I need to wear gloves if I have, for some reason, a cut on my hand or something like that? Should I wear gloves before I touch the patient, even though I wash my hands? Okay. If you have a cut, scrape, scratch, whatever, you know, in, in an area that you're going to touch the patient with, so hands, forearms, that type of thing. Ideally, it would be covered with a bandage. If you can't cover it with a bandage, then wear gloves. You want you do want to protect the patient um, just to make sure that there's no transfer. Because remember, that's a doorway out of you. Right. And chances are, I mean, almost everything that we do as CNAs involves a patient's doorway in. Think about it. Mouth care, that's a doorway in. Denture care, that's a... Remember those ADLs, things you do for yourself every day, right? Those are all doorways. So helping somebody eat, toilet, right? That, those are all doorways, bathe, doorway. So we have to think as a CNA, we work with a lot of patients' doorways. So if we're going to be um, anywhere near those areas, we would want some gloves as well. Good. Questions? Great question. Very good. All right. So let's move on to page 64. All right. So, so far, we've learned skill rules. We follow the care plan. We've learned the opening, knock, 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 hi, Miss Jones. We've learned how to evaluate whether we need gloves, and we've learned the closing. So right now we have four of those 11 banners covered. This is the fifth one we're going to learn, barrier rules. A lot of the skills that we do are going to require supplies, okay? Um, mouth care. What, what kind of supplies would we need to do mouth care? If I'm going to brush somebody's teeth, what do I need to brush teeth? Toothbrush, okay, toothbrush, toothpaste. That's a good start. Well, yeah, something to wipe their mouth. Sure. How about a water source? Like a cup of water? Would that be helpful? Um, they're probably going to get toothpaste all over their clothing because they're sitting somewhere. So what would I need for that? A towel. Sure. And I'm going to be touching their body fluid. So I need gloves. Yeah. So I got a lot of supplies to worry about with this skill. That means that I have to have a place to put those supplies. It's fair. Do you think this table is clean? No. Lots of things have sat on this table. It probably has jelly from breakfast, maybe some brown gravy from last night's dinner. Probably had a urinal sitting on it. 
make me just cringe. Um, probably chapstick, cell phone, crossword puzzle book, all kinds of stuff. So I can't consider this table clean. I have to make it clean. In order to make it clean, I'm going to use a barrier, something to put on the table to separate that dirty surface from my clean supplies. Okay, so let's say that we have done our opening. Hi, Ms. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today and I'm here to do mouth care. Is that okay? Awesome. I'm going to close your curtain, go wash my hands, get my supplies, I'll be right back. I have washed my hands. Now I need to get my supplies, but I know I can't put them on this table. So I'm going to go get a barrier. Now a barrier can be anything. I can use a washcloth, I could use a towel, I could use a paper towel, I can use anything as a barrier, just something to separate this table from my supplies. But for the test, we're gonna use a very specific type of barrier. That's this. This is called a disposable under pad and we use it for two reasons. It's waterproof, and it's absorbent. And I'm gonna be working with water and saliva, liquids. I don't want that on the table. So we're gonna use a chucks, which is the nickname for this, on the table. And then I can get my supplies and put them on the barrier, okay? Remember a barrier is just anything that separates the dirty surface from your clean supplies. You can use anything as a barrier, but for the test, we're gonna use a disposable under pad. Now, the reason that we call them something different is because that's a lot of syllables, disposable under pad. That, that's a lot to say. And it is a little bit different than a washable under pad. So this is a washable under pad. Again, a lot of some syllables. I'm not going to say washable under pad, disposable under pad. I'm going to say bed pad for this and chucks for that because it's the type of under pad that you chuck after you're done with it. Okay. So you'll see this uh, defined as a chucks, but its actual name is disposable under pad. Some of you guys know them as puppy pads. All right, now the other problem with uh, barriers, with these particularly, is I have a lot of supplies I need to get, okay? So I've done my opening, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I need to brush your teeth, is that okay? I'm gonna close your curtain, go wash my hands. So I've now washed my hands. I'm gonna get all the supplies I need to do this particular skill. So. I'm going to get, come over here. I'm going to get a barrier. I need a towel. I need a basin, toothpaste. I need a toothbrush. I need a cup of water and I need a set of gloves. My uniform is not considered clean because it's brushed up against that curtain, it's leaned up against the bed, it's pressed against the sink, it is not considered clean. So when I try to get all of this stuff at one time, I'm gonna end up holding it up against my uniform. And what is that gonna do to all of this stuff? Contaminate it. So this does not work. Do you see why? This is an actual graded checkpoint on the exam. You cannot hold patient use items up against your clothing. 
So a better way for me to do this would be, all right, Ms. Jones, I'm gonna close your curtain, go wash my hands, get my supplies, I'll be right back. I've washed my hands, I'm gonna go get my barrier first before I get anything else. I'm going to spread it out on the table and now I can go get the rest of my supplies and have a place to put them so I don't hold them against my uniform. Good. Questions? Barriers are the first thing you get. If you're gonna use supplies, you need a barrier. If you're gonna use a barrier, it's the first thing you get. Okay? And then you, when you go to grab your supplies, you put them down one at a time? You can, yeah, if you're getting several uh, linens, as long as you're not holding them against you, you can grab a couple of things and put them on, you know, at one time. You don't have to get them one at a time, but the goal is that you're not holding things against your uniform. And in order to spread this out, I would have to hold all that against my uniform. Okay, so does that make sense? Do you understand barriers? All right. And I have a video on that. You can watch the video if you wish. So now let's move on to mouth care, page 66. So let's get this out of the way. Students ask me, am I really gonna have to brush somebody's teeth on the state exam? Yes, you will. Yep. Yep. Um, you know that reaction you're having right now? That cringe, ooh, I don't wanna brush somebody else's teeth. You are going to be a patient during the exam. That means that somebody else may be brushing your teeth during this. Now you're cringing harder, right? You don't want anybody in your mouth. Bad enough that you're going to have to do it to somebody else, but you definitely don't want anybody in your mouth, right? That's a reaction you're having. I know it is because that's a reaction everybody has. So I want to address this right off. First of all, if your patient can brush their own teeth, they will. I'm not coming to your house at six o'clock in the morning tomorrow morning, shaking you awake and saying, come on, I'm going to brush your teeth. I would look like a mad person because you're capable of brushing your own teeth. Nobody else is going to do it for you. That's just weird, right? That puts me in a creepy category for sure. If your patient can brush their own teeth, they will brush their own teeth. It wouldn't be on the care plan for you to do that. Does that make sense? We're only gonna brush people's teeth if they can't do it themselves. Now the care plan may have you set it up for them and clean up after, yeah, that's possible. But the care plan may also have you perform mouth care for somebody who can't do it on their own. But if your patient can't brush their own teeth, you've got to do a good job. Good job. Don't just try to rush through this because you find it icky. I'll tell you a story about this. This was awful. There was a young man that um, was in a motorcycle accident, was in the ICU for weeks and weeks and then moved uh, to a step-down unit and then moved to a rehab uh, area. And he wasn't talking much. He was paralyzed. Um, I mean, it, it, it was for the really, really, had a traumatic brain injury. I mean, this was a really bad situation. But um, every time that I spoke to him, he'd kind of turn his head away and just mumble. So I'm thinking, you know, and he didn't talk a whole lot. I'm thinking he's probably pretty depressed over his current circumstances, understandable. And I'm thinking about getting, uh, talking to the doctor, getting a psych consult, try to figure out how we could help this, this young man adjust to his new situation. And it dawned on me before I did that, I was like, I wonder if there's something going on with physically with his mouth. So you know, because he had the traumatic brain. I mean, he went face first into some hard object. I don't know what it was. So maybe there's something wrong with his mouth. 
So I ask him to open his mouth so I can take a look to see what we're working with. And he immediately clams up and goes, uh-uh. What's going on? What's, what, how come you won't let me look in your mouth? What's going on? Well, it turns out that nobody had brushed his teeth since the accident. He knew he had horrible breath. He could feel the stuff growing on his teeth. It was awful, awful. So now I've got, oh my gosh, this is horrible. So the first thing I do is we're going to do some mouth care, get all the nooks and crannies, get it all cleaned up for you, and then see what we're dealing with. And he ended up having to have several teeth pulled because of it. Now, you know, this is bad enough, guys, that this poor kid was in a horrible, tragic accident, is paralyzed. His entire life has changed, but now on top of it, because of our negligence, he's going to have to have dentures in his 20s because of our negligence. And that's what it was. That was negligence. Everybody knows, a six-year-old knows, you have to brush your teeth. Adults know you have to brush your teeth. And if you don't brush your teeth, bad things happen. I don't understand why CNAs will skip mouth care because they think it's gross. Don't do that. These are real world people, real world consequences. I don't care how gross you think it is. It's something the patient needs help with, right? Does that make sense? So you have to practice this to be able to get over your reaction to it. But trust me, the patient isn't gonna want you in their mouth if they can do it themselves. Okay, good, does that make sense? That was absolutely, uh, to me, that was worse than the motorcycle accident because that I had no control over. Horrible. All right, so. How do we know what to do with each patient? Care plan. care plan. Our care plan at the top of the page here tells us a resident with natural teeth is lying in bed and needs mouth care. The resident is not able to provide their own mouth care. So who's going to do it? We are. Absolutely. Is lying in bed a safe position for mouth care? So what do we need to do? Yeah, put the head of the bed up. But let's think about that for a second. Hmm. So I go in and do my opening. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today, and I need to do mouth care. Is that okay? She says yes. I close the curtain. Now, I know the head of the bed has to go up. I know it does. Because that's not safe. But is that bed controller clean? Who can touch the bed controller? Yeah, CNA can, but who else can? Anyone. Yeah, anyone. So if something is available to be touched by anyone, can we assume it's clean? Okay, so if we know the bed controller is probably not clean, when do I want to put the head of the bed up? Before? or after I wash my hands? Before. Before, that's correct. So during my opening for this skill, I wanna get the patient in a sitting position before I go wash my hands. Chances are you're gonna forget though. You will. So, because you're used to doing things in a certain way, right? So chances are you're going to forget to do that. So let's say that I've done my opening. Ms. Jones, is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close the curtain, go wash my hands. I now have clean hands and I come back and I see the patient still laying there. Oops, how do I get them up? Well, I know that bed controller is not considered clean. So if I grab a paper towel, I got to get one of these that follows me around the room. <laughs> If I grab a paper towel 
and then use the paper towel between my finger. Okay. Between my finger and the bed controller. Now I'm not getting my hands dirty while I do this still. Now these beds are slow. They're slow on purpose. They're slow on purpose because if somebody is in a hospital bed, chances are they're probably either um, injured or they're ill or something. You tied it to the wrong place. Um, or something that uh, is making them somehow, if we move the bed too fast, it can either cause injury Nausea, dizziness. Yeah, they're not healthy. If they were healthy, where would they be? Home, right? They're not healthy. So these beds move super slow on purpose. One of the dangers here, the, the problem that a lot of CNAs run into is they don't wanna wait for that bed to go all the way up. They get impatient. So they stop the bed when it's up just a little bit and they think good enough. For the test, that is not good enough. We have to keep pressing that button until the bed stops moving. It's not like a cartoon. It's not gonna clamshell closed, okay? It doesn't do that. I can press this button for the next hour. It's not gonna move any more than it has. It, it's stuck where it's at, okay? So we have to get the patient into a full upright sitting position. Does that make sense? Good. Okay. Ideally, I want to do that before I wash my hands. But if not, I can use a paper towel after. Now, something to note, though, when you get the patient sitting up, this pillow that's behind their head, very comfortable when they're laying down. But when they're sitting up, that can actually push their head a little bit more forward. And this can be an aspiration risk because our head is not in good alignment. If you notice that, if their head is a little bit forward, you can ask them to lean forward and slide that pillow down behind their back. And then they're in a much better position for mouth care. Good? Questions? Okay. This is a mannequin. This, if you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see this is going to be done on a real person. I was just showing you on the bed on the mannequin. But when you're working with a mannequin, you need to treat them like they're real. Okay, don't do things like this. Okay, um, they will grade that. You have to treat the mannequin as if she's real. So be gentle, provide support, everything that you would do on a real person. takes forever, no shortcuts. Okay. All right, questions on that? Okay, so if you're going to do mouth care, we're gonna follow the care plan. We're gonna do our opening. We're gonna get a barrier and we're gonna evaluate if we need gloves. Now I know I'm going to be around saliva, so that's body fluid. So yes, I need gloves. So then we're gonna do the skill and then our closing. So this particular skill is going to encompass four of our principles on the back wall. There are some uh, skills that we do that encompass all of them, but we're going to get to the rest of them step by step as we need them. Okay, good. Questions? No? All right, I am going to show you this uh, video for 
a couple of reasons. Number one, it has good close-ups, and I think that's important for this particular skill. The other is I can never get a volunteer. <laughs> um, so I'm going to show you the video for this one. Um, but a couple things to remember while we're doing this particular skill. So we've talked about this one. The patient must be sitting fully upright. Remember, up a little is not good enough. Fully upright. We want to protect the clothing. We've talked about that too. A towel over the chest, that way toothpaste doesn't drip down. We want to brush all surfaces and the tongue, but for the test, there's no time involved. You don't have to brush for two minutes. They're not going to give them one of those chewy pink things that froths up and then you got to get all that stuff out. It's nothing like that. You're just going through the motions. You're showing you know how. Okay, so there's no time requirement here. Just make sure you get everything. You should actually say out loud, I'm brushing the top, I'm brushing the back, I'm brushing the bottom, back and front. Kind of talk it out because those evaluators, you don't want them like right over your shoulder. You want them on the other side of the room. If you're talking it out, they get to stay over here. That way they're not hovering, okay? We always want to wet the toothbrush before we apply the toothpaste. And that's the, just like the soap, right? Remember I said we had to wet our hands before we put soap or soap on to get it to distribute? Same thing with toothbrushes. You've got to wet them first to put toothpaste on so that the toothpaste distributes and it doesn't just blob in place. Of course, we want to allow the patient to rinse and spit, just like you. And we want to leave the patient's face and clothing dry for this skill. So these are going to be the important checkpoints for this particular skill as we go through the video, um, make sure that all of these checkpoints are being addressed. So we'll watch this video and then we'll take our break. Yes, your camera is still facing up. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Like I said, I need one of these that follows me. <laughs> thank you very much. Hello. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. I need to do mouth care. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to put the head of your bed up. And then I'll close the curtain, wash my hands, and gather my supplies. Okay. We'll get you to a full upright sitting position for safety. And if I can get you to lean forward, please. There you go. Is that more comfortable? Yes, much. Okay, I'm going to close your curtain and wash my hands now. I'll gather my supplies. I'm going to start with the barrier and we'll place that on your overbed table. I'm going to get a towel, a set of gloves, a basin, toothbrush and toothpaste, and a cup of water. We'll prepare the toothbrush first. We'll get it wet, place a little bit of toothpaste on it, and set it in the basin. Mr. Jones, can I place this towel over your chest? Yes, please. And now I'll apply my gloves. I'm 
Okay, Mr. Jones, can you open wide for me? I'm going to brush the back on the bottom. The back on the top. And can you bring your teeth together? And stick your tongue out for me. Thank you. Set that aside. Go ahead and take a sip. Rinse your mouth. Let me wipe that off for you. Another sip. No, thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to dispose of my cup, wrapper, and toothbrush. I'll be right back. I'm going to remove the towel and place it into dirty bunnet. I'm going to go clean the basin and I'll be right back. Place the toothpaste in the basin. Use the paper towel to open the drawer and place the basin and toothpaste in the drawer. I'll clean up my work environment and go throw these items away. Now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? A magazine? Okay, your fall light is right here. If you should have any needs, let me know. Can I adjust the head of the bed for you? Okay, I'm going to open the curtain and go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about my skill, make any corrections I need to make, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Okay, any questions on and that? And then one? I'll be evaluated. I still leave. Any questions? I'm not there. No. All right, go ahead and take your break. Come back at 10 till. I'm so sorry. I don't know. <laughs>
my god, a minute.
Oh, the blue shoes when I start to squeak. Yeah, that's sweet too. <laughs> Okay, so remember that ADLs are activities of daily living. They're things that we do for ourselves every day if we're able to. Um, and they're what CNAs are mainly going to do in a clinical setting is help patients with those activities that they can't do on their own. Uh, CNAs will also help nurses with um, nursing tasks like vital signs and things like that. But the majority of what we do with the patients is going to be ADLs. Um, like mouth care, ADLs are things the patients would normally do for themselves if they were able to. So dressing a resident, we're not going to do that for them if they can dress themselves. We're just gonna provide the level of assistance they need based on their condition or limitations. Does that make sense? Right, so ADLs, are um, the majority of what patients do. So mouth care is an ADL. The next one that we're gonna learn, dressing a resident is also an ADL skill. Most of what we have in here are ADL skills. Um, before we get to dressing though, I just briefly, very briefly wanna go over basin cleaning. This is another principle. We're going to get into this a little bit more later in the program, but we're going to just kind of barely graze over it right now. When you saw the video for mouth care, you actually saw me rinse, dry, and store that basin. And that's all we have to do for the test is rinse it out, dry it, and store it where we found it. That's it. That's all we have to do for the test. Um, but it is useful to know that a lot of settings will also have you disinfect it. You can't disinfect something if you're holding it because where you're holding it is contaminated just by virtue of you holding it. So you always have to set it down to disinfect it. And that's why you see basin cleaning done the way it's done. We dump it out wherever it normally goes, rinse it, and then set it down. That's when you would disinfect it if you needed to. But for the test, we don't have to do that step. We're going to pick it up with a paper towel. We're going to dry the inside with a paper towel, dry the outside with a paper towel, and then use a paper towel to open the drawer to put it away. Okay. So you're going to see that over and over and over. We have a ton of washing skills that we learned to do. So you're going to see basin cleaning a lot in this program. We'll go over it a little bit more when we get into some of the washing skills, but just a basic understanding. As CNAs, we rinse, dry, and store. That's all we have to do. Remember, those basins are only used by that one patient. They're not passed around. They're not used by everybody. Okay? 
All right, so let's go to page 70. I'm gonna go ahead and open up the, um, the door here just to have a little bit of fresh air come in. I don't wanna turn the AC on. Yeah, the AC gets it too cold. So I wanna open the door here. It's such a beautiful day. I could have class outside if I could figure out how. <laughs> okay. So, so far we learned skill rules. We follow the care plan. We've learned our opening, knock, 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 hi, Miss Jones. We've learned we use a barrier if we're going to use supplies, how to evaluate if we need gloves and how to take them off if we wear them. We just covered base and cleaning rinse, dry, store, and we know the closing. So right now we are over half done with our principles. We're gonna learn one more right now and that's privacy blanket, okay? So privacy blanket is covered on page 70 and it's pretty easy. We use it anytime a patient is uncovered or undressed. Remember I said that for the closing, at the end of the skill, we have to make sure the patient is covered, right? Remember that's an important, because it just looks funny if you walk by and the patient's totally uncovered. It also probably makes them feel exposed and vulnerable. Well, the same thing when we're doing skills. If we take that sheet away, your patient is gonna feel very vulnerable, but they're also probably pretty cold. And it's important to understand that their perception of temperature is different than ours. Right now, I'm standing up here, I'm active, I'm talking. So the temperature in this room feels different to me than it does to you. You're sitting there, not very active at all. So you're probably perceiving the room temperature a little cooler than I am. To me, it feels a little warmer. The temperature is the same for both of us. It's how we're perceiving it. Does that make sense? Okay, in a clinical setting, anybody know what, you know, uh, do we keep hospitals warm or cold? cold? Cold, right? So we are active, fully dressed, active. Our patients are laying there inactive, dressed in a hospital gown. Are we perceiving the temperature the same? No, it's cold to us. How do you think it feels to them? Freezing, now take those sheet away. So we need to understand that our perception of temperature is different than theirs. And that's where the privacy blanket comes in. If I'm gonna take their sheet away, I've gotta recognize the fact that they're probably pretty cold and make sure that they're covered while I'm doing the skill. Does that make sense? Um, it's also for protection and privacy. And let me explain this in a way that you might understand a little bit better. So let's go over here for a second. So during the skill, I'm going to do my opening. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to get you dressed. Is that okay? She says, yes. I close the curtain and I go wash my hands. Who is that curtain uh, designed to protect the patient from? Yeah, other people, other people wear. Okay, so outside of this little protected area, right? If I pull the curtain, everybody outside of the curtain can't see in. But do you know who's inside the curtain with the patient? Yeah. Us. We're strangers. We tend to forget that. Because to us, this is just a routine skill that we're going to do. We don't really pay attention. You know, why should the patient object to me seeing all their dangly bits? Well, the patient might object. They're not used to showing their dangly bits to all the people, right? So we have to understand that privacy goes beyond the curtain. The curtain does provide privacy for everybody, you know, to keep everybody out there from seeing our patient. But it doesn't do anything to protect them from me. Privacy blankets are important. They should not be skipped. 
the patient should always be covered somehow. So if we're going to use a privacy blanket, we're going to do our opening, wash our hands. Now we're ready to get our supplies. So we'll get a barrier on the table, get our supplies. And when we get that privacy blanket and we put it on the bed, we don't want to just pull that sheet down. Remember the patient should never be uncovered or undressed. So we're not gonna pull the sheet down. We're gonna take the privacy blanket and put it over the sheet. And then pull the sheet down from there. So if you do it this way, the patient is always covered. Does that make sense? At the end of the skill, when we're all done, we'll take that sheet and pull it up over the privacy blanket and remove the blanket under the sheet. So again, the patient is always covered. Now, anything that you remove from the bed, we need to wrap up in a ball. If we don't wrap it up, if I just pull it out from under the sheet, now I've got trailing edges that can contaminate surfaces. We have to keep control of all of our linens. So when I take this out, I always wind it up in a ball and we're gonna put it in the dirty linen hamper. Make sense? Good? Okay. Now, when you put a privacy blanket on, so I go get my blanket, I bring it to the bed and I'm ready to put it on the patient. I don't want to do what I do at home. I don't want to take this blanket and snap it. See all those fuzzies that just came up? Those are the patient's dead skin cells, yeast, bacteria, all the things the patient has shed while they've been in bed. And when I do that, when I snap it, I create a vortex that brings it right here where I can breathe it in. So don't create a vortex, don't snap or shake. The other problem with snapping and shaking is when I do that, you see how it can hit the patient? You ever been flicked by a towel before? It's not pleasant. So we simply unfold and spread out. We don't snap or shake. Good? Questions? Okay, so our patient should never be uncovered. The uh, blanket should be put on over the sheet. Sheet be, should be pulled down underneath. When you're done, the sheet gets pulled over and the privacy blanket comes out underneath. Everything gets balled up and put into dirty linen. Good. Questions? Do I hold it here? No. All right, so how do we know when to use a privacy blanket? Anytime the patient is uncovered or undressed, we're going to use a privacy blanket. So that's this uh, banner here. Now, the thing about privacy blankets is that they're not specifically required for the state exam. You could do the same thing using the sheet. The checkpoint that's listed is um, minimize exposure of resident, right? So you could do the same thing with the sheet. But the problem is for this skill, specifically dressing, I have to dress the resident. That means I got to get to their feet and their legs. And it's really hard to get to their feet and their legs with the sheet tucked in at the bottom of the bed. So I'm going to have to untuck the sheet to be able to get to their feet and their legs. Um, other skills, the privacy blanket might get, or if we use the sheet, it might get wet, you know, if we're doing partial bed bath. Or it could get soiled if we're helping them with a bed pan. So there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to use the sheet, why the privacy blanket is better, because we're going to take it away at the end of the skill. Okay, so it, there's no checkpoint that says use privacy blanket, but it's a good 
way of satisfying the checkpoint don't expose the patient. Okay, so you'll see this accomplished in a couple of different ways. I use privacy blankets. All right, so uh, go to page 71 and we're gonna learn how to dress a resident with a weak arm. Now I start you out with these two skills because they should be somewhat familiar to you. You've brushed your teeth before, I'm sure, right? So performing mouth care shouldn't be too much of a stretch. You're kind of familiar with it. You've gotten yourselves dressed before, I'm sure. So this shouldn't be too much of a stretch. That's why I start you out with these two skills because they're familiar. They're things that we do for ourselves all the time. The next skill that we're gonna learn pulse in a little while, that's a new skill for us. So we're venturing out of familiar territory. But the first two skills, we're kind of gonna kind of dip our toes in the water and understand how to use these principles with skills that we already know. Okay, good. Questions? All right, how do we know what to do with each patient? Care plan. So our care plan at the top of the page here says, dress the resident in a long sleeve, button or snap front shirt, pants and socks. The resident is lying in bed and has a weak right arm. The resident is not able to help with dressing. After dressing, leave the resident in bed. It's a long care plan but I wanna take it piece by piece because each one, it seems pretty simple, but each one of these things means something. So let's take it step by step. It says, first of all, dress the resident. That means they're not doing it. It doesn't say assist the resident with dressing. So dress the resident, who's doing it? We are. Okay, then it says long sleeve button, or let's go long sleeve. Let's stop there, long sleeve, long sleeve. What's the weather like outside? Warm. It's gonna be almost 90 degrees today. If I were getting up in the morning, this morning, and I knew it was gonna be about 90 degrees today, do you think I went in my closet and looked for a long sleeve anything? No. And that's what we're used to doing, right? We know the weather and we, we are used to selecting clothing based on what the weather is gonna be like and what we're gonna do that day, our activities. Good, make sense? I probably wouldn't choose long sleeve, but our care plan says long sleeve. Do I get to go by what I think the patient should wear or what the care plan tells me the patient should wear? The care plan. So that's important because we choose long sleeves based on the weather, but in healthcare, we use long sleeves for other things as well. There are some medications that make the patient photosensitive. That means, doesn't have anything to do with your camera. <laughs> that means if, if the medication is photosensitive, we want to uh, reduce the exposure to sunlight. So long sleeves would be a necessary component of that. Um, and I, when I was young, I actually made this mistake. So who knew that those little stickers on pill bottles actually meant something, <laughs> right? So I was 18, 19 years old, knew it all. I had um, a medical condition. They put me on antibiotics for, and little stickers said avoid direct sunlight. I'm 18, 19 years old, who cares? You know, I don't pay attention to stuff like that. And I had planned a trip to Daytona for the weekend. Now, this is back when I could wear a bathing suit nicely. <laughs> and I spent all day on the beach in Daytona. And when I got off the beach, my best friend and I, um, we went into the hotel room and she looked at me and she went, oh, and I thought, oh. I must be red because, you know, I turn like lobster red five minutes in the sun. And I thought, okay, I'm probably red. And she said, you are purple. I said, purple, purple's not my color scheme. What happened? What's going on? And I looked down and sure enough, I was purple. Well, that little sticker on the bottle actually meant something because what happened with that particular medication 
is exposure to sunlight caused my capillaries to burst. So all under my skin, I was literal pinprick bruising from all these burst capillaries all under my skin. Well, now I have a hard time being in the sun for a long period of time. It um, causes like zap feelings in my nerves. Uh, so this has had a lifelong impact on me. Um, so, you know, those little stickers actually mean something, right? They mean something. So if I've got a patient on a medication that I know causes photosensitivity, my care plans say to dress the resident in long sleeves to prevent that type of problem. But it's not just medications we have to worry about. There's some conditions that are worsened by being out in the sunlight. Autoimmune disorders are one of them. So long sleeves are about way more than just temperature regulation. But they're also used if the patient has a weepy rash like shingles to try to prevent that weepy secretions from being spread around. So when you're reading a care plan, don't immediately think, oh, it's too hot for long sleeves. I'm not dressing the patient in that. They're used for more than just temperature. Good? Okay. The next part of that says button or snap front shirt. So let's stop there for a second. We know about long sleeves now. Let's look at the button or snap front shirt. Now, all of you have on clothing that you pulled over your head. And that's usually what we wear. Like t-shirts are pullovers. Blouses are usually pullovers. Almost everything in our closet is pullover. We're used to pullover. And that's fine for the most part. But if you have a weak arm or limited mobility, pullovers are really, really hard to put on because it's hard to extend that arm up if you have limited mobility or if you've got a shoulder issue. So those patients, we tell the patient or the families, go get button-ups or snap front shirts because it's easier to dress side to side than it is top to bottom when we have a mobility issue. Now, further on in this care plan, it actually tells you which arm is weak and it says right arm. So there's something that we use here to remember how to dress somebody. It's USA first. You can actually see that in, on step nine, USA first. USA stands for undress strong arm first. Yeah, and that's exactly why, because we're gonna make the stronger arm do all the work. So the stronger arm's gonna have to pull itself out of the sleeve. And now when we bring it around, the um, garment just slides right off that weaker arm. And then when we dress the patient, we'll dress the weak arm first so the garment slides on the weak arm and make the stronger arm do all the work, okay? So USA first. Now, the care plan goes on to say pants and socks. We don't care about that. You're gonna put pants and socks on the patient. No accommodation required. Just put pants and socks on. It doesn't matter how you dress the patient. If you wanna start with the socks, that's fine. You want to start with the pants, knock yourself out. If you want to start with the shirt, no problem. However you want to dress the patient is fine. You just have to remember when it comes to the shirt, it's USA first. And then dress the weak arm first. Good? Now, I'm going to do it when I dress the mannequin. I start at the bottom and work my way up. And the reason for that, it's easier to put a shirt on somebody that's sitting up rather than laying down. So I'm gonna put the head of the bed up to dress the resident, to, to put their shirt on. But you can't pull pants over hips if they're sitting, that doesn't work. So then I'd have to put the head of the bed back down to put their pants on. And then now that they're dressed, they're probably gonna want the head of the bed up before I leave. And that's just a whole lot of wasted time. So I put socks on, then pants on, head of the bed up, put the shirt on, and now I'm good to go, okay? So it's just a little time saver, but you can do this in any order that you want. Our patient is definitely undressed for this, so I'm going to need a privacy blanket. I have supplies to gather, so I need a barrier to put them on. 
This patient, this one right here, if you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see that this is done on a mannequin. So this patient right here does not require gloves. They're not leaking anything. I'm not gonna touch any personal skin. They have no open areas. I don't need gloves for this skill. But if I'm dressing somebody who recently had a hip surgery and they got an incision all down their leg, do I need gloves? If I'm dressing somebody who is incontinent and not holding onto their urine all by themselves, do I need gloves? Okay, so do you understand how to evaluate whether we need gloves? For the test, none of that applies to this patient. Let's go back to the top of this care plan real quick. It says long sleeve, button or snap front shirt, pants and socks. Does it say anything about undergarments? No, we follow the care plan, the whole care plan, Ann. So the care plan doesn't say undergarments. Do we need them? Nope, don't have to worry about them. The assumption is they're probably already wearing them. Okay, the test isn't grading you on putting underwear on a patient or a bra. Some patients will want them, other patients won't, it's fine, um, but it's not a component of this skill for the test. Good? Questions? bottom where it says time 14 minutes does that mean like how much time you have to do this one particular skill okay so great question great question so prometric did a study years ago they watched a whole bunch of you guys do each one of these skills and they timed how long it took and they then published that information so somebody with your level of experience which is none should be able to dress a patient in 14 minutes or less, should be. Now, it doesn't mean that if you take a little longer, it's an automatic fail because for the test, it's not, the, the timing isn't done individually on each skill. Go to page 56 for me. And I'll show you how the timing works. Okay, so when you go take the test and you get a skill set, so give me a number, one to 11. Five, all right. So when you get your skill set, this is skill set five, okay? Your skills are measure and record respirations, make an occupied bed and change position, excuse me, to supported sideline. Those are your three skills. They're not going to tell you you have five minutes to do this skill, five minutes to do that skill, 14 minutes to do that. Skill. They're not going to do that. They're going to give you a total amount of time. They're going to say these are your skills and you have 35 minutes to do this skill set. Make sense? Okay. So let's figure out how did they get that number, 35 minutes. So in the middle of the first column on page 56, you can see how much time is allotted for each skill. So our first skill was measure and record respirations. How much time would you have for respirations? Five minutes, you guys see that? Five minutes. All right, what about making an occupied bed? 14 minutes, so five plus 14 is 19. So that's what we have so far. What about change position to supported side lying? Eight minutes, so 19 plus eight is 27. Well, I told you you had 35. Wait a minute, where's the rest of the time? Everybody's going to get three minutes for hand washing. So hand washing isn't even, doesn't even take time off of your skill. So you get three minutes for hand washing. So 27 plus three is 30. And then they're going to give you five minutes of transition time. I call this thinking time. Remember I said you can make corrections, right? You have to think about your skill first though. You kind of have to review what you did. You also probably want to think about your supplies. You probably want to think about how to do the skill. You need some thinking time. So that's not part of the skill. They're going to give you that on top of it. So you have three minutes for hand washing, five minutes for thinking, five minutes for respirations, 
14 minutes for occupied bed, eight minutes for supported sideline position, and all together that gives you 35 minutes. Okay. Now, you get involved in your skills and you are starting to wonder how close am I on time? Am I going to go over? How am I going to know? So at five minutes before your time is up, so at 30 minutes, they're going to tell you five minute warning. Now you wanna get as many checkpoints checked off in that five minutes as, as you can. So supersonic hedgehog hog speed, right? You're gonna speed this up, get as many checkpoints in as you can because it's not an automatic fail if you go over on time. It's just whatever you didn't get to is gonna count as a deficiency, okay? but where do those evaluators want to be? A Mai Tai, yeah. They're, they want to be at home, floating in their pool, drinking their Mai Tai. If you're taking the maximum amount of time for every skill, they're going to be tapping their feet because that's not where they want to be. So you want to practice this enough that you develop a little bit of muscle memory so that you can kind of move through the, the skills at a little bit brisker pace. Remember, this is based on somebody with no level. Okay, so let me get to there. So go back to dressing a resident. Go back to page 71. Look at the bottom of the page. How much time are they giving you for this? 14 minutes. Yeah. Now, I have had days where it took me that long to get dressed, but it wasn't because it took me that long to get dressed. It took me that long to figure out what I was going to wear, right? It doesn't take 14 minutes to put a pair of socks on, pants on, and shirt on. So you have to remember that these timings are based on somebody with no experience. They're giving you a ton of time to get these things done. You should not ever go over on time. But you can start a skill over if you need to. They don't like it. Where do they want to be? At home. They don't like it, but you can. If you've completely, or let's say that you are dressing a resident with a weak arm, but um, you misread it. You thought you were dressing a resident with a weak arm, but it was actually change an occupied bed. So you did the wrong skill. So you can start over. You can say, oh my gosh, I don't know where my mind was. I, I totally blanked. Let me stop. I'm going to do the skill I'm supposed to do here. That's fine. That's fine. Um, or if you're dressing a resident, you get halfway done and you realize that the patient's uncovered, you didn't close a curtain, you, you know, you're all over the place, you can re-center, start over. It's okay. But remember, the clock is still ticking. You don't get extra time. 35 minutes is all you get. Use it wisely. Okay, does that make sense? So you can start over. You should think about your skill and make corrections. The time is there for you to use, but be smart about it. Great question on skills timing. All right. So How do you decide in the morning what you want to wear? Depends on the weather. Okay. So it depends on the weather, your activity. What about how you're feeling? Does it, that ever play a part in? Yeah, most of the time. Yeah. If I'm feeling bright and sunny and cheery and it's going to be a really good day, I might put on a bright, sunny, cheery color, right? If I'm feeling, uh, I just don't want to, I don't want to be here, I don't want to do this, I might put on a dark, dreary color, one that suits my mood, right? But the point is that it's my body, my day, and I get to pick unless I'm working at a place that requires a specific outfit. I get to pick. At what age are you willing to give that write up? Willingly? Never. Willingly? <laughs> Never. So when you're 82, you still want the ability to choose your own clothing. 
So a good part of what we're going to do is make sure that our patient's rights are protected. And we're gonna ask, what do you want to wear today? Now, our patient may describe something that doesn't match. I want my purple plaid pants and my yellow sunflower top. And you're like, oh no, <laughs> that doesn't work. Patients have the right to choose their own clothing, yes, but you are judged by the way your patient looks. You are. If I walk down a nursing home hallway and all the patients that are sitting there are dressed in clothes that don't match, I'm gonna think I got a whole bunch of CNAs that just don't care. You are judged by the way your patient looks. So you are allowed to make a suggestion. Oh, Ms. Jones, how about your white shirt with those pants? That would look really nice. Most of the time they'll say, yeah, that's what I meant. But sometimes they'll insist, no, I want my yellow sunflower shirt. Okay, no problem. They have the right to choose their own clothing. Now remember that, um, and this is especially important with women. Oh my gosh. If the woman's son and daughter are both coming to visit today and the son bought the pants and the daughter bought the shirt, she will wear both of them even if they don't match because she's honoring her kids, right? We're not going to stand in the way of that. So sometimes the things that they ask for may not make sense to you, but they do to them. Now, on the other hand, we may have an older man who has no idea how to put an outfit together. And this is increasingly common, actually. Not because they're stupid. They're not stupid at all. It's because it was a skill they never had to develop. You know, growing up in the 30s and 40s, clothes were very expensive. They weren't easily obtainable. And most times you only had three outfits, one you wore yesterday that's being washed, one you're wearing right now, and your Sunday best that you wear to churches and weddings and funerals. When that gets a little bit old, that gets rotated into daily and you buy a new Sunday best outfit, right? So when this guy woke up in the morning, he didn't have to think about what he wanted to wear. He only had one choice. Now, as he got older and turned 18, he joined the military. Uncle Sam was going to make a man out of him. And Uncle Sam only gave him three outfits, one he wore yesterday, one he's wearing now, and his dress, whatever colors, blues or whites or greens. So when he gets up in the morning, does he have to think about what he's going to wear? No. He gets out of the military and gets married because that's what you did back then. And wife's job was to cook and clean and lay out husband's clothes for the next day. So when he got up in the morning, did he have to think about what he wanted to wear? No, it was already done for him. Now, all of a sudden you're in his room going, what do you want to wear today, Charlie? And he's like, oh, yeah, somebody, yeah. I've never had to pick a, an outfit out. I mean, why? So we need to understand that everybody's experience in life is not the same as ours. Now, I've got an entire room devoted to my clothes. I call it a walk-in closet, but it's a room, right? I have choices for days. I can go across the street to the dollar store and get a t-shirt for three bucks. Clothing is cheap. It's readily available, and we have whole rooms to house it. It wasn't always like that. And we need to understand that a lot of our patients and residents that we're gonna care for had different experiences. Now, a lot of our old men get around this in a really funny way. You'll open up their closet and it's the exact same shirt, seven of them. Maybe different colors, but the same shirt, like seven polos. And the pants are all exactly the same, all khaki or all black or all navy, but it doesn't matter what they pick, they go together, right? No choices required there. So when you open up a closet and you see that, that's somebody who out of necessity has decided that this is the easiest way to arrange their wardrobe so that they don't have to make those decisions, okay? So we do ask, what do you want to wear? 
We can make a suggestion, but we're always going to honor their wishes because remember that clothing choice is an outward expression of what we feel inside. Good. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So here are our checkpoints. These are the things that we need to make sure that we do while we're doing this particular skill. We're gonna ask about clothing preference. We're gonna get the clothing before we undress the patient. Why would that be important? Why would we get the clothing before we undress a patient? Okay, so it's it's, in close proximity, but most importantly, our patient should never feel uncovered and vulnerable, okay? I mean, how comfortable would you be naked with a stranger in the room? Even with a blanket covering you, how comfortable would you be? Not comfortable. And we have to remember that. And a, a big part of what I'm trying to do is to get you to start thinking about things from the patient's point of view. Because right now you're focused on you your steps, your tasks. We always have to take a step back and think of this from the patient's perspective. You are a stranger. They are naked. They want to be naked as little as possible. Okay, good. We want to lift from below and we're going to support the joints as we move them. We're not the claw machine at Walmart, right? We're not gonna reach down and lift something up like this because then your fingers can dig into them, can cause bruising, but the extremity is likely to slip out and that can cause injury. So if we lift from below and provide support, it's a much more stable and supportive experience for the patient. We're gonna undress the strong arm first and dress the weak arm first. We don't wanna overextend or force movement. Let me show you what I mean. This is a testing mannequin. She was used for testing when we were at testing center. Now she has steel cables running through her that hold her together. Steel cables. Is that a normal position for a foot? No. The steel cable that was holding this foot in a normal position was broken during testing. they forced it. So, do you think they passed? I hope not. I don't wanna be the body in the bed later if they pass, right? So don't overextend or force movement. That's what that means. Because if you broke a steel cable, you darn sure broke a patient, right? the best visual example I can give you. The next day, when, when I saw that, when I was putting the, the room together for testing, I asked the evaluator, what happened? And she says, oh yeah, putting on socks and turn that foot right around the cable snap. <laughs> ah, ah. Yeah, that's just, don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. So if I'm going to put their socks on, let me move this so you can see. If I'm going to put their socks on and I need to lift that leg up to pull it over their, um, their heel, right? I don't want to lift like this. First of all, I'm not supporting at the knee. The leg is drooping, right? And it's taking a lot of force on my hand to try to hold the leg like this. Chances are it's probably going to fall. It's gonna slip out of my grasp. Where if I lift from below, I'm providing much more support. I'm supporting at the knee and the ankle. And that would allow me to be able to, if I'm holding it, to be able to pull the, the sock over. Okay, so that's any extremity. We always lift from below and we support at the joints. Good question. 
Dirty items go in the hamper. This is important. They don't go on the floor. Now I know at home, when we change the sheets, we throw them on the floor. Sometimes when we get out of the shower, the towel goes on the floor. Sometimes if I'm getting dressed or undressed, the clothes end up on the floor, right? We don't think anything of it at home. Things go on the floor. We'll pick them up eventually, but we don't think about it. Now in healthcare, nothing can go on the floor. Nothing clean and nothing dirty. Nothing goes on the floor. So that means that whatever we take off of the patient either will go on our barrier or directly in dirty linen, either one, but they don't go on the floor. Good? Okay, at the end of the skill, of course, we have to give the patient the call light during our closing because that's part of our closing. But for this particular skill, because it tells us the patient has a weak right arm, where do you think the call light needs to be placed? On the left hand, yep. And it has to be in the left hand, not just dropped on the bed, here you go. We have to put it in the left hand. Well, let me show you something when it comes to that. So we have this patient in a bed here. Let's say that we've gotten her dressed and it's time to give her her call light. Now I know that this call light has to go in her left hand. Her left hand is over there. You can't do this. Why would that be important? Why would that, why can't I do that? Okay, well, it's near her left hand. Or I can even put it in her left hand for you. But look at this cord. Look at this cord. So if I put this in her left hand here, what's wrong with that cord? Yeah, it's across her. What happens if she tries to roll over? That's exactly it. It's a safety concern. It could get tangled on her neck and cause her to um, interfere with her airway or cause her to choke or even cause bruising. So if I need to put this call light in her left hand, we would do this. You guys see that? Small step seems very inconsequential, but it's not. It's actually very important. Good? Questions on that? Okay. So we haven't, it's not on my slides, but I want you to go to page, let's see, hold on, I gotta find it here. Go to page 92 for me. 92. So, so far we've learned skill rules. We follow the care plan, the opening, knock, knock, knock. We use a barrier if we're gonna use supplies. We evaluate if we need gloves. We use a privacy blanket anytime the patient's uncovered or undressed, right? So right now we know the first five. Linen rules is something we're gonna cut, touch on on Monday a little bit more, but we just learned most of this already. We can't let uh, um, supplies touch our, yeah, our uniform because the uniform is not considered clean. If we're gonna go get supplies, we have to have what kind of hands, clean or dirty? Clean hands to get our supplies. We don't wanna snap or shake the linens because it brings all of the patient's um, ick, yeah, particles up where we can breathe them in. Um, we don't want anything to touch the floor, whether it's clean or dirty, right? So we've already learned most of linen rules already. So that's number six. And then we had basin cleaning that we touched on, rinse, dry, store, and we've learned the closing. So right now we only have four more principles to learn. That's not hard, is it? Not hard, okay. 
So I wanted to point that out that we already have covered most of linen rules. We'll go back and cover the rest of it shortly or uh, next week. All right, so. All right, I am going to, um, I'm going to show you the video for this one. Sometimes I do this live. Sometimes I'll show the video. I like the video for this one just because it shows close-ups of putting the socks on and the shirt. Remember that undress strong arm first? And I think that it's important that you see those close-ups. If you're out there, it's a little bit harder to see. Okay. And then if you need me to, I can uh, demonstrate this live for you at a later date if um, you need a little bit of additional help. Okay, so um, remember that these are the steps that we want to make sure that we're getting. Remember how we talked about skills timing? How much time we have? I have a whole video on that that you can watch. It's only six minutes, but it helps uh, explain how that works. All right, how much time at the bottom of that page um, dressing was 71? How much time did it tell us that we had? Okay, you see how much time I get this done in? And that includes the whole intro, you know, the music and the supplies and all that, and all the credits at the end. So it's taking me less than seven minutes to do this, and you have 14. That's what I'm saying. They give you a ton of time. Stretch it up so I have control over all the material. 
Well, then place it over your foot, lift from below, and smooth it over your heel. So I'm going to repeat on this side. I'm going to put my hand inside the front of the leg of the pants. And then place it over your foot. Lifting from below and supporting with your heel. Then we finish putting on your pants. Okay, Mrs. Jones. Now I'm going to lift your pants up over your hips. So if I can have you raise up your hips as high as you can on the count of three. One, two, three. I'll make sure that your pants are over your hips and then have you back up. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to elevate the head of the bed now. Please tell me when you're comfortable. And if I can assist you to lean forward, I'll untie your gown. Thank you. I'm going to tuck a corner of the blanket behind your back as you sit back. And now we'll remove the gown from this side. We're going to undress the strong arm first. Since our care plan indicated your right arm is weak, we'll undress your left arm first. I'm going to the other side of the bed now. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to undress this arm. Being careful to minimize the movement and support the arm at the elbow as I lift it off the bed. We'll remove the soiled gown. We'll go ahead and rest your arm back on the bed. Okay, now I'm going to assist you with your shirt. I'm going to scrunch up the arm of the sleeve put my hand through backwards, keeping your arm supported on the bed, I'm going to lift your hand and hold it as if we're shaking hands. This will keep all your fingers together as we place the sleeve over my hand and then over yours. Once we have the sleeve in place on your arm, we'll extend your arm out. I'll support at the elbow as I bring the sleeve the rest of the way along your arm. If I can have you sit forward, Ms. Jones, let me assist you. Thank you. Make sure that you remain covered and smooth the shirt along your back. Come on back, Mrs. Jones. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to assist you in putting your other arm in your sleeve. So I'll scrunch it up, put my hand in through backwards. And Ms. Jones, if I could have you reach your arm up and back for me. I'll assist you to put your arm in the sleeve. Okay, Ms. Jones, we'll rest your arm back on your bed now. While I straighten your shirt and make sure that it is snapped appropriately. Can I have you lean forward for me, please? Thank you. And I'll make sure that this blanket can be removed. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm just going to gather up the privacy blanket and place it in front of linen along with your gown. I'll be right back. Okay, Mrs. Jones, I'm just going to adjust the clothing for neatness and appearance to make sure that it's fastened appropriately and that you look good. Very nice. Okay, you have your call line here if you should need anything. Can I get a magazine for you? Okay, I'm just going to throw your barrier away. And open your privacy curtain. Now we'll go wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Any questions? Pretty easy one. 
does take a little bit of practice though, especially working with a mannequin because she doesn't really move the way a human moves. So that's one you'll probably want to practice here. Okay. Let's go to page 87 real quick. So earlier today, we talked about the chain of infection. You guys remember the chain of infection? Right, no pathogen, no problem. The pathogen has to have a place to live. Oh, eight, eight, seven, 87. You're welcome. Let's see if I can find it again. There we go. So that pathogen has to have a place to live. And as long as it's inside somebody else, it's not a problem for us. It's only if it has a way out, right? The problem is that you can't tell by looking at somebody whether they have a pathogen in them. It doesn't, there's no like LED screen on our forehead that says hepatitis, HIV, TB. There's nothing that, and a lot of times your patients don't even know because they haven't been diagnosed yet. Maybe they don't even have symptoms. So you can't tell by looking at somebody whether they have a communicable disease. So if I'm going to touch any body fluids, remember I said, this is where we have our problem, right? So as long as it's inside the patient, that's fine. As long as it has no way of getting out, I, it's not a problem for me. But if I'm going to touch anybody's portal of exits or their body fluids, I've got to protect myself. This is called standard precautions. So we use them with everybody. It's standard. So anytime I'm going to touch butter, blood or body fluids, I'm using another uh, layer of protection, right? Okay. So we learned that earlier today, but the name for it is standard precautions because it's standard. We use it with everybody. Now, let me tell you a story about this. When my son, my oldest son, was 18 years old, he went and helped his dad do some um, uh, work on a, and he, they did some work, but it, they were working with um, equipment and, and stuff. Well, something fell on his leg and actually scraped his ankle down to like the tendon. And, you know, he, his dad called me, what do I do? I said, go to Walgreens CVS right around the corner, go get these things clean it up, bandage it, bring them home, and I'll take a look at it, right? So he gets home, my son does. He sits down in a chair, and they had done a field dressing, and um, he's, he's taking the bandage off for me to take a look at it, and I go and grab a pair of gloves. He says, Mom, why are you wearing gloves? I'm your son. I said, yes, but you've been out of my sight for more than 15 minutes in your lifetime. And I don't know where you've been or what you've done. That's how serious standard precautions are. Standard precautions does not recognize love as a boundary. Okay, does that make sense? So if I'm using standard precautions on my son, do you think I'm using them on somebody I don't love? Absolutely. Does that make sense? Okay, so standard precautions are used on everyone. They're standard. There are no exceptions to that rule. I don't get to tell HIV, oh, I don't understand, I, but I love my son. How could you do this to me? You know, it, it doesn't work like that. There are no boundaries there. But there's another type of precaution. So we use that with everybody because we simply don't know. We can't look at you and see. But there's another type of precaution that we use when we do know. So standard precautions is when we don't know. And then transmission-based precautions is when we do know. So if you look, turn on page 88, You'll see this called isolation precautions too, but its technical term is transmission-based precautions. Now, if you remember, I said that pathogens don't have arms, legs, or wings. They require fluid to get around. Everybody remember that? 
The problem is we have a lot of different fluids in our body. So if it's a flowy fluid, like blood, blood doesn't fly through the air. It's a flowy fluid. Urine, that's a flowy fluid, right? Things that flow. Well, if it's a flowy fluid, I'm probably not going to breathe it in. It's not going to get into my eyes. I have to come into contact with it. So that's called contact precautions. If it's a pathogen that hitches a ride in flowy fluids, I need contact precautions. So I probably want to glove up. I might want to wear a gown. Flowy fluids. But some pathogens don't hitch a ride on flowy fluids. They hitch a ride on expelled fluids, coughing, sneezing, laughing. So through things in the respiratory tract. Now those, even though the pathogens don't have wings, those fluids fly. So flying fluids, I need a different type of precaution against. Probably still gonna wear gloves and probably still gonna put on, on a gown because flying fluids aren't particular where they land, but I'm also gonna want to protect my face. So a mask or a shield, you know, or go, I'm sorry, goggles or a shield and a mask. That way I'm not breathing in those flying fluids. So flowing fluids, I'm probably going to use contact precautions, gloves, gown. Flying fluids, I'm going to use those gloves, gown, and goggles and mask. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're going to have to dress for the job, dress for the pathogen. Now, you don't have to figure all that out, thankfully because the infection control people, the nurse or the doctor who's in charge of infection control, they're gonna figure all this out for you. They're gonna figure out what the pathogen is, how it's getting around, and they're gonna put a sign on the door that looks like the one you see on page 88. And they're gonna mark off everything that you need when you're providing care. So again, we aren't thinking here, we follow the care plan. In this case, this is a part of your care plan. So it's going to tell you exactly what you need based on whether it's a flowing fluid or a flying fluid. Good? Make sense? But you have to know how to put those things on and more importantly, how to take them off without cross-contaminating. Remember, we had to learn how to take off gloves. Same thing here. We want to put our PPE. It's called personal protective equipment. All of that stuff I just talked about because it's protecting my person. <laughs> so I got to figure out how to put it all on. Now it's not the same order. We don't put it on and take it off the same way. So if we're going to put it on at the top of page 88, you'll see donning. Remember it has on in the name. That means put on. We're going to put the gown on first, followed by the mask, the eyewear, and gloves last. Remember the first thing your gloves should touch is the patient. That's why gloves go on last. Okay, but if we're going to take them off, we don't want to take our gloves off last because now we're touching everything, right? So that's the first thing that comes off is those gloves, then your eyewear, then your gown, and finally your mask. Guys, you need to memorize this. You will have a question on donning and doffing PPE. You need to know what order they go on and what order they come off. Now, I'm going to give you a really easy way to remember the doffing, taking off, right? If you've done patient care, your gloves now have pathogens. You want to touch anything with those gloves? Get them off, right? That's first. Now, eyewear is going to come next, right? Mask or, or uh, you know, eyewear is going to come next. The reason that, that it comes next is because um, your gown is probably dirtier than that, okay? You don't want to touch your gown. Remember, you don't have gloves on. You don't want to touch your gown and then your eyewear, okay? 
So eyewear, then gown. Why is mask last? Well, remember these are flying fluids, flying fluids. So you don't want to be in the patient's room without a mask with flying fluids. So mask is always last because you tend to breathe. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so gloves first, mask, then gown. I'm sorry, eyewear and then gown, and finally mask because you need to breathe. Good? Questions? Questions? No? Okay, so remember standard precautions are used with everyone. Transmission-based precautions are when we know you have a condition, something that can be passed on to others. So COVID was passed on through flying fluids. So what kind of PPE would we need if we were caring for COVID patients? Flying fluids. Definitely eyewear, gown, mask, gloves. Yeah, we're going to need it all, right? Right? And you would probably want to wear them all <laughs> so that you don't take it home to your family because you probably like them, at least a little. All right, let's go ahead and take a five minute break. Come back at 10 after and we're going to get into pulse.
right, so let's move on to page 35. How do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan. So this care plan tells us the patient will be lying in bed for the skill. Take the patient's radial pulse measured at the wrist for one full minute and record your readings. Pretty easy care plan. How long are we counting for? One minute. Okay. Those of you who know shortcuts, and it is okay to use a shortcut in most settings. You count it, If you look at a clock, one whole minute is made up of four 15 second segments, right? You can cut, if you cut a minute into four, it's their 15 seconds. So you could take somebody's pulse for 15 seconds, multiply that by four, and then you get your, your one minute reading. And it's perfectly okay to do, but not with this patient, why? Yeah, easy answer. Care plan says one full minute. Now, sometimes your um, patients are going to have conditions that a 15 second count isn't enough. We need that full minute count. And that would be reflected in the care plan. If the care plan doesn't say, then 15 seconds is fine. Multiply that by four. But in most settings now, we don't even take a manual pulse. We use one of these guys. This is a pulse ox. So its big name is a pulse oximeter. But when you turn it on, the LEDs will light up. You put it on a finger like a clothespin, and it's going to give you the oxygen saturation and the pulse rate. So if you give it just a minute here, you kind of have to uh, let it read for a minute. But do you see my pulse rate there at the bottom? What does my pulse rate say? Okay, it's, yeah, because I'm active now, right? Mm -hmm. So it's giving me a pulse in real time. So it's going to fluctuate. If I sit down and put my feet up, it'll go down. If I stand up and move around, it's going to go up, right? Based on what's my, what my heart is doing at that particular moment. Your heart is not static. It's not one number all the time. It's going to vary depending on whether you're hot or cold, active or sedate, hungry or full, nervous or calm. It's a lot of things that are going to affect the heart rate, but it's constantly going up and down. Okay. So most of the time we use one of these and that gives us the reading. We just write down a number, you pick any of the ones that are coming up <laughs> and that's perfectly okay. But we still have to know how to take a manual pulse because normal is between 60 and 100. That's what's normal for a pulse. If I use one of these little gadgets and I get something abnormal, let's say I get 112, right? 60 to 100 is normal. So if I get 112, that's not normal. But how do I know? that it's accurate. I don't, because it's a machine and the batteries might be going dead. It might've gotten dropped, which can affect the calibration. There's a lot of reasons why it may not be accurate. So if, if it gives me an abnormal reading, I have to check it manually myself because I don't wanna go to a nurse and say, hey, the patient's pulse rate is 112. And then the nurse is going to call the doctor and say, the patient's pulse rate is 112. And the doctor is going to say, okay, I want you to give them this medication. If we go through all of that and the patient's pulse isn't really 112, now we're medicating a patient for a condition that doesn't exist. And that could have a consequence to the patient. Does that make sense? So if we get an abnormal reading on an automated device, no matter what the device is, whether it's a pulse ox, a blood pressure monitor, or anything else, we always have to know how to double check it manually. And that's what we're going to learn to do here. Good? Okay. This care plan tells us to count for one 
full minute. If you look at the bottom of the screen here, you'll see that somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this within five minutes or less. We're only counting a pulse for one minute. So you throw an opening in the front, that's like 20 seconds. You throw a closing in the back, that's like a minute. So two and a half minutes maybe, right? They give you plenty of time here, good? This is gonna be a real live patient, so one of you. It's patient's going to be in bed, just like this lady. Charting is required. Normal is between 60 and 100. And for the test, you can be off by um, four beats in either direction. So let's say the evaluator gets 76. If you got 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, or 80, you're considered accurate. That's a big margin of error, guys. That's a really big margin of error. So it's not really about being accurate. It's about following the care plan. That's really what they're grading you on here, okay? So let me show you where a pulse is located. So if you hold your hand out like you're gonna shake somebody's hand with your thumb sticking up, there's a bone that runs right along the top of your wrist. See if you can find your bone. Do you feel your bone? Feel that bone there? You stand your hand, your fingers up on that bone like you're gonna dive off a cliff and just roll them forward. Put your thumb on the back. You stand your fingers up and just roll them forward. Put your thumb on the back. You should feel thumbs under your fingers. So let me come help you. It's way at the top by your thumb. So yeah, we're gonna stand up right here, roll over, thumb on the back, thumb on the back, super important. Mm -hmm. Feel it, okay. So, are you right-handed? Yes. Okay, let's use your right hand. So roll forward. Thumb on the back, super important. Thumb on the back, super important. Do you feel your thumbs? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So hand up, fingers on the bone, roll them forward. Thumb on the back, super important. Thumb on the back. Do you feel thumbs? Use your fingertips rather than the flat part of your fingers. Right. Use your fingertips. Oh, yours is thick. Relax your wrist. <laughs> Relax. Right here under my fingers. Right there. Come on. Relax. And hi, Grace. Feel it? <laughs> yeah. Yours, you've got a lot of musculature in there. So when you hold your, your wrist stiff, that the muscles and tendons are actually covering your artery. So we need that arm to relax a little bit. Did you find it? Yeah, but you show me. Okay, so we're gonna roll forward, thumb on the back. Okay. Did you find it? Okay, so for those of you playing along at home, okay, if I have my my hand out here, my thumb up, I've got a bone right here. Can you guys see it? Bone right here. If I put my fingers on that bone and just roll forward, the artery runs right here underneath that bone. What I'm trying to do is push that, that artery up against the bone to put some compression on it so I can feel the thumbs. So fingers on the bone, roll forward, thumb on the back. Thumb on the back, super important, super important. But if you look close, you can see that I'm actually using my fingertips, not the flat part. If I just lay my flat fingers like this, I'm not gonna feel it. Your fingertips have way more nerve endings. You can feel a whole lot more with your fingertips. So that's why you want to roll forward with your fingertips and put your thumb on the back, not flat. You want to kind of arch those fingers. Now, the thumb on the back is important because if you find the pulse, if you just put your fingers there and you feel your thumbs, how long do we have to count for? One full minute. Your hand is going to relax. Your fingers are going to relax and then you'll lose it. If you put your thumb on the back side, that holds consistent pressure and you don't lose the count. 
thumb on the back, very important. Good. Questions? Everybody good with that? You never use your thumb to take a pulse. So don't do this. Your thumb has an artery. You'll get your own pulse. <laughs> it won't help you a bit. It's not giving us the patient information we need. So two fingers on the artery, fingertips, thumb on the back. We're going to look at the clock, pick a starting point, and we're going to say start out loud because you know who's on the other side of the patient, on the other wrist. Who might that be? The evaluator. They've got to start counting when you start, and they've got to stop counting when you stop so that you get the same number. That's how they're going to judge accuracy. Good? Does that make sense? So important, don't use your thumb. Use, use your fingertips and make sure the thumb is on the back side. We're going to count for one full minute, but let me give you a little, uh, little trick. Just like with uh, hand washing, do you remember when we did hand washing, we actually used the clock to time it? We're going to do the same thing because there's a clock right above the bed, just like here, the clock right above the bed for the test. You're going to look at that clock and you're going to pick a starting point and say start out loud. That way the evaluator counts when you do. But you can't stare at that clock because if you do, your brain will count the seconds. You can't change that. That's the way our brains are wired. They're wired to pay attention to what we see first, then what we hear, and then what we feel. Way down the list. So you can't stare at that clock. So you're probably going to forget where you started. Now you can wait until that second hand gets all the way to the 12 to start if you want to. You got to realize just how long a minute is, right? That doesn't, it, it, it's just a lot of wasted time. So a better option is you can start on any number. So let's say I decide to start on the six. I'm going to say, start. Now I do this with my hand. This hand is on the pulse. This hand is reminding me when I started the time. One, if I started with the second hand on the one, I do this. If I started with the second hand on the two, I do this. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. I never start on the 11. I'll just wait for the 12. So this hand keeps track of where the second hand was when you started. That way you always know where to end. Does that make sense? Good. So if I start with the second hand on the one, I do this. If I start with the second hand on the two, I do this. If I start with the second hand on the seven, I do this. That way this hand always reminds me of where I started. Or you can wait until the second hand gets to the 12 if you really want to. Okay, good. Make sense? Questions? Concerns? We're not supposed to look at the clock. Right, you're gonna glance at the clock. Just glance up now and then, okay? okay? So can you come over here for me? Um, let's see here. Can you move to that chair for me? And can you come over here and sit in this one? Okay, so I want you to find a pulse in somebody else's hand. So go, go find a pulse. Go find a pulse. <laughs> just fine. Don't count. You're not going to count yet. Just find a pulse. Just find a pulse. Find a pulse. Everybody's going to find a pulse. Everybody finds a pulse. Everybody finds a pulse. Yep, find a pulse. Everybody find a pulse. Everybody find a pulse. Yeah. 
Find a pulse. Remember to use your fingertips, not the flat part of your finger. I know it's gonna be hard because you've got nails. Tips right there, one on the back. Then you kind of bend your wrist. Let me show you. Watch my finger. Mm -hmm. Do you see how my fingers, yes. how they bend here and here? Mm -hmm. They're not flat. Okay. Okay. So you really want to try to get your fingers to bend so that you're using your fingertips. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Got it. Okay. Did you find any? Oh, oh find, find a pulse. Here, find a pulse. Are you right handed? <laughs> okay, so let me see your right hand. So you want to go overhand. Okay. There you go. Thumb on the back. It's going to be up a little bit more toward the ceiling. There you go. Oh, I think Yeah. Got it? Okay. So now that you found a pulse, let me tell you what you're finding. Let me explain what a pulse is. Yeah, you can do an overhand grip like a guitar. Yeah. So that's good. That that's kind of like you're holding a guitar. So you can you can go this way or you can go this way. Both of them will work. Okay. Now which side of the patient you're on is going to depend on which hold you're using. So let me explain. Let me explain. So I'm right-handed. This is my right hand, right? Okay, so this is my right hand and I'm gonna use my right hand to get the pulse. Move that out of the way. So if I'm standing on this side of the patient and I'm going to work on this arm, and I'm gonna use my right hand, right? I am going to, her hand is like this. I am just gonna put my hand in place, right? Just like this. But now if I go over to the other side, right? If I'm over here and I'm gonna get a pulse, I'm on the other side, I'm on the outside. So I can do this or I can lift her hand up and come in from the bottom. Right, so you can either go the top or come from the bottom. So the, where you stand on what side of the patient you stand on is going to dictate the hold that you use. You need to get comfortable with both, okay? Coming in from the bottom or going over the top. But for the test, you get to pick which side of the bed you wanna be on. So if you have a hold that you prefer, Make sure you know which side of the bed you need to be on. How are you going to find that out? Practice. Because the evaluator will take whatever arm is left over. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So let me explain to you what a pulse is. I mean, what is this thing that we're feeling, right? So you have... Okay, you have a heart in your chest, that heart squeezes. When that heart squeezes, it pushes out a wave of blood. That wave pushes the one in front of it. That wave pushes the one in front of it. That wave pushes the one in front of it. This is how blood moves through your circulatory system. So if I were to cut open an artery, we would actually see a wave in a valley, a wave in a valley, a wave in a valley. Anybody watch slasher movies? Yeah. Slasher movies? Yeah, they get this right because the blood spurts, spurts. Spurts, wave, valley, wave, valley, wave, valley. Got it? Okay. That's how blood moves through your circulatory system. When that wave moves through, it causes a bulge at the top of the artery as the wave is moving through. All we're doing is pressing down to feel the bulge. If we count the bulges, then we know how many times the heart beats. So that's what we're doing. We're measuring how many times the heart beats by counting the waves 
that we feel move under our fingers. Okay, good. Questions? Questions? So this is where we're going to find the artery. It's going to be at the very top of the wrist, like where the lines are. Way up here, remember, not your thumb. We're going to use our fingers with our thumb on the back side. And we're going to compress until we feel those thumbs. So we're going to pick a starting point on the clock. We're going to say start out loud. So everybody counts at once. And we're going to count the thumps we feel until that second hand goes all the way around to that point, And we'll say stop. Whatever number we get is what we're going to write down for documentation. Hopefully, it's within four beats of our evaluator's number. Now, how many evaluators did I tell you that there usually are? Two. two. Not all places are going to have two because, you know, we have a shortage like everybody else. But if you have two evaluators, you actually have to do this skill twice because the patient only has two arms. You're counting on one. One of the evaluators is counting on the other. If you have two evaluators, they both have to be able to judge you independently. Okay, does that make sense? Good. Great question. So let me explain to you how this works. That's a great question. When you get your printout at the end of the skill, uh, Okay, so you get your printout at the end of the test, and this has all of your deficiencies. Remember what a deficiency was, right? Something that didn't get checked off. If it's only listed once on here, if you have two evaluators, but it's only listed once, it did not count against you. Because that means somebody saw it and somebody wasn't paying attention. If it's listed twice, that means both evaluators uh, called you deficient on that particular skill or it's a step. So it only counts against, if you have two evaluators, it only counts against you if it's listed twice. Good. Do you think it's possible that sometimes their minds might wander? Where do they want to be? Yeah, at home, in their pool, drinking their Mai Tais. So that's one of the reasons we have two evaluators because if somebody misses something, the other one will pick it up, okay? Two evaluators, I know a lot of students get stressed out about that, but two evaluators actually is for your benefit. It's for you. Yeah. Sure. Just the counting, like, <clears throat> is there like a certain tempo that like a temp that we should go at one? Yeah. Three, or like, cause being, you know, I don't wanna go too fast. Or, you know. You're gonna count what you feel. Okay. So the patient is actually going to determine the tempo. So, yeah, it, and that's a very common misconception. We're not just counting, we're counting what we feel. So if the patient has a really slow heart rate, it could be one, two, three, four, five. Are you alive? <laughs> If the patient has a very fast heart rate, it could be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And that gets really hard when you get up into the big numbers like 47, 40, because you know, your brain is trying to, you know, say the number in your brain, and then there's more. So fast heart rates are actually kind of hard to count because you know our words for numbers are really long when you get up into the upper numbers. Does that make sense? 77 takes a long time to say in your brain. So if you can, I know it's kind of hard to do because you're used to thinking about numbers and words. Like when I say 77, you probably see the letters, right? If you can change in your brain to start looking at them as numbers. Seven, 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 eight, seven, nine, seven. Yeah. If you can kind of do that, especially if you've got a very fast pulse rate, it's easier to count. That's kind of an advanced tip, kind of advanced, but it's um, something that you'll learn to do over time. 
is to think in numbers rather than letters. Good? Make sense? Do you guys understand the, um, do you understand this, what we're counting? Okay. So, when we're taking a pulse, there's a couple things that we have to be aware of. Um, we're always going to support the arm. An arm that is being held up like this is uh, the pulse rate is going to be affected because that stress on the muscles. Stress muscles require more blood flow, which means the heart has to pick up its pace. So we're not getting an accurate reading. So the arm has to be supported. Now, remember, your patient is lying in bed for this skill. So when you're taking the pulse and they're lying in bed, you don't want to hold the arm up. You can hold the forearm up. That's okay, as long as the elbow is supported. This is fine. This is not. The arm has to be supported. If you want to leave the arm on the bed, you're going to be bending like this for a full minute. That doesn't sound like long, but it is. You can raise the bed up to a comfortable working height, but at the end of the skill, you have to lower it all the way back down. If you forget to lower the bed, it's an automatic failure. Let me say that again. If you forget to lower the bed, it's an automatic failure. So my suggestion, don't raise the bed, raise the forearm. Good? Make sense? Okay. All right. We're always going to report, or it's always reported over a minute, but our counting may not be a full minute. We're going to follow the care plan. Remember, if you count for 15 seconds, you just multiply that by four to get your minute reading. Normals between 60 and 100. What would I do if I got 58? Who do I tell? The nurse. What do I do if I get 114? Tell the nurse. We're gonna use our fingertips, not the flat areas of our finger, and we're never gonna use our thumb to take the pulse. Remember, your thumb has an artery. Radial pulse is at the top side of the, uh, the top of the thumb side of the wrist near the bone. Remember, we have to say start and stop for timing. In Florida, we'll count with two evaluators, and of course, we're gonna document at the end because if we count something and we don't write it down, it doesn't mean anything to anybody. Nobody can act on that information. It's like we never even did it. Good. So we're gonna take a pulse now. The way we're gonna do this is I'm gonna do the timing for you. So all you're gonna have to do is find the pulse and count. That's all you need to do. Okay, so you're gonna be the patient first, put your arm out for her. And you're gonna be the patient first, put both arms out, please. Okay, so find the pulse on the arm that you're closest to. Yeah. Remember the arm, the elbow has to be supported. There you go. When you have the pulse, say yes. Um, can I ask you to go sit in that chair for me? Because it would be easier for me to. Oh, you're fine. I'm actually going to turn this around a little bit. Well, we're actually going to put it, uh, uh, she's going to put them on the table. <laughs> it should just be your, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Put this arm down and let me have this one. Okay. So you guys good over there? Okay. When I say start, I want you to count the thumps underneath your finger until I say stop. All right. Got it? Ready? Start.
stop. What'd you get? 79. I got 79. Good. What'd you get? <laughs> okay. All right. So one of you two is now the patient. Put your arms out. Okay. So you're the patient. Put your arms out. And then when you find the pulse, say yes. Okay, ready? Start. What'd you get? Okay. okay. And I know you lost yeah. it. Okay. So do you see how there's two people counting and one patient? That's the way it's going to be on the test. So you're counting, the evaluator's counting, and there's one patient. So now I'm going to be the patient. So you're going to be the patient now. A little bit high. I'm definitely a little bit high. So let me have my wrist back that way. So right there. So it's it's a little bit further down the wrist. That's a little high. Everybody got it? Got the pulse? Ready? Set. Start. Stop. Awesome. What'd you get? Okay, very good. Very good. Okay, you guys can resume your seats now. All right. The name of the game here is the practice. There's no way around it. Um, everybody's pulse is going to feel a little bit different. Some people are a little weak. I mean, it's really hard to feel. You kind of have to struggle. Others are really strong, like boom, boom, boom. You can feel it from across the room. Um, some people are really fast. Others are really slow. Everybody's a little bit different in the way that this feels. So um, the name of the game here is to practice. Okay, good. So this skill, we're gonna do our opening. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to get your pulse. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands, find the pulse. Tell the evaluator start. Count for one full minute. Tell the evaluator stop. And then you're going to wash your hands and document. Right, do our closing, wash your hands and document. 
if there is a second evaluator and they need you to count with evaluator number one, you won't have to do your closing. They're actually going to let you write down the first number like it never even happened kind of thing. And then you'll count with the second evaluator, do your closing, wash your hands, document, and wash your hands again. Okay, good. Question? Right, closing with the second evaluator. You can write down your number after the first one, but you'll do your closing and hand washing all that after the second. Good. Did I go too fast for anybody today? No, we covered a lot of information. Yes. The only thing I'm worried about is monitoring the time while counting. That is yeah, and it does take some practice yeah. because you can't stare at the clock. Right. So you're going to glance up here and there. So what is our normal value? 60 and 100. So I don't even look at the clock until I get to 50. Right. Don't even look at it. I mean, and then I see, oh gosh, I'm only halfway there. Oh, I don't have to look back until like 90 now, right? Because, you you know, if you're only halfway there on the time, you know, you've got, some, so it's, it's fine tuning that timing thing. And then once you get closer to the end, you look back a little more frequently, but don't stare at the clock because you will, you'll, you'll get, you'll get 60. You'll, you'll get 60 and 60 is normal for a pulse, isn't it? So it doesn't flag us. Yeah, I my own uh, rule of thumb is if I ever get 60 on a pulse, I always recount because chances are I was watching the clock. Yeah. What happens if you are go over the full minute on the test? Well, if you're over by a second or two, it's no big deal. If you're over by 20 seconds, that's a big deal because it's going to affect your count. And your count is what we make medical decisions on. So you want to be as close to that minute as possible. A second or two in either direction is okay. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking for, are you counting for 15 seconds? Are you counting for three minutes? You know, that's what they're, they're looking at. Okay. Does anybody have any final questions? You are going to have uh, chapters two and three to read over the weekend. Chapters two and three. So you'll take the test in the white book. You'll take the test in the white book and grade it. So when you come into class on Monday, um, I'll get your scores. Here's your review sheet from today. You should be able to answer all of these based on our conversations in class, but the answers are at the bottom, so you can always check your answers. Those of you joining us from YouTube world, you can also access these review sheets in our online course. Go to courses.foryourcna.com, click on li uh, classroom live stream, the very first lesson. And below the live stream will be the um, review sheet. So feel free to print that out and use it for review as well. All right. Well, you guys did a great job today. Great job. And I hope you have some fun this weekend. Don't, you know, make it all about homework. Beautiful weather out there. Go do something fun. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Otherwise, I will see you on Monday. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, YouTube World does not have any questions, so... Uh, we're going to go ahead and sign off of YouTube as well. If you have any questions, please remember I'm doing the live question and answer session tomorrow at three. You'll want to tune in for this one because I'm doing a really good lesson uh, before we do the question and answers. It's something that all CNAs need to know about. So it's going to be a really good presentation tomorrow uh, at three o'clock Eastern on our YouTube channel. So if you have a chance, tune in or catch the replays. 
If you are subscribed to us, YouTube will automatically let you know when I go live so you never miss a, a session. And remember that um, you can go back and watch the game show from yesterday. It was a good one. And it'll go right along with chapter two and three that you're going to be studying this weekend. All of these videos are available on our website as well. All right, guys. So YouTube world, happy caregiving. Catch you tomorrow. Bye.